Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen decides to take my iPad because she doesn't like my art. Just some basic things I'm adding to give context. I'm female, I just turned 18 and I'm new to Reddit. I live with my adoptive parents and they are the sweetest people you'll ever know. For my birthday, my granddad got me an iPad, an Apple pen, and a drawing app that I had been asking for. I love doing digital art and I was definitely ecstatic when I got it. My mom was so excited for me and took me shopping to get me a case and stickers to decorate it with. The friend in question, I'll just call A, is the nicest person I've ever met. She's my closest friend and I don't blame her for what happened. I'd gladly take a bullet for her any day. A is also 18. The person who I can't help but despise is her mother. I'll just call her Karen because why not? Karen is 38. The son she wanted to give my iPad to, I'll just call B. B is 10 years old. Karen is a single mom and has made it the base of her personality. She runs a failing mommy blog and is used to posting parenting videos. She's a very spiritual person and believes heavily in karma and creativity. She homeschools B and doesn't teach him how to read or write, just teaches him about karma and things of that nature. With that random word vomit out of the way, I'll get to the story. Yesterday, Karen came over to drop off A so we could hang out and have a girl's day. My mom invited Karen in for coffee and let B have control of the TV remote. I immediately showed A my tablet and we both started acting like idiots and talking about color palettes. B didn't seem to care, but I caught Karen looking at us weirdly from the kitchen. I ignored it because I figured she was just watching B. A few hours went past and it started to rain. It wasn't just a drizzle, it was a downpour and there was no way Karen could drive home safe. My mom told Karen that she and B could stay in the guest bedroom and A and I could sleep in my dad's game room. It has a pullout couch facing the TV so we were fine. B whined that he wanted to see the game room but my dad has a rule that no one under 16 is allowed in as he has some scary games and concept art littered around. Karen protested lightly but my mom shut her down and she dropped it. B had a full meltdown, so A and I went to draw in the crafting room, the basement. I decided to show A some of my more scary drawings and pulled up a picture of a werewolf I had drawn. It wasn't gory or anything, but it was scary and I didn't want to have it pulled up in case my mom saw. A and I love scary things, so we decided to make a piece together. We put on a 5 minute timer and each took turns drawing. When we were done, we had drawn a vampire biting a girl. We made it a bit scary and drew the vampire clawing at her. We printed the picture and hung it up so we could decide a color palette, but in the middle of selecting paints, we heard the door open. We had locked it, but it was one of those crappy hook locks, so all it took to open was a few shakes. B came down the stairs and at first he didn't notice the printed paper. A told him to leave, but he ignored her and went to try and grab my mother's colored pencils. We stopped him and while we were dragging him towards the stairs, he saw the picture hanging on the corkboard. I didn't know something so small could make a sound so loud. He screamed his lungs out and bit A's hand so that she would let him go. He bolted up the stairs and I took A to the sink to wash her hand. We had a sink installed so we could wash paintbrushes. Within seconds, Karen was down the stairs and I heard my mom trying to calm down B upstairs. The following is the conversation. I'm going to leave out the words she said that I can't repeat here. So if you see any weird baby talk, just know the conversation wasn't as nice as I typed it out to be. Karen, what the heck did you do to my son? A, we didn't do anything. Me, he came down here, so we tried to take him upstairs and he bit A's hand. Karen, no, what did you show him? At this point, we didn't know that B had even seen the drawing. Me, what? We didn't show him anything. He just came down here and started screaming when we moved him. Karen, don't you lie to me, you little jerk. He told me he saw you drawing something horrible. A figured out what she meant before I did. I know, I'm stupid. A, you mean the collab? It's a vampire. 
I looked over at the cork board finally catching on and Karen ran over when she saw me looking. She ripped the paper off the tacks we had used to put it up and gave this really dramatic gasp. She put a hand over her mouth and her eyes got wide. She looked ridiculous. Karen, does your mother know what kind of filth you've been drawing? I was dumbfounded, so I just answered honestly. Uh, yeah? Karen looked even more offended and noticed my iPad on the table. If you're going to be drawing such inappropriate filth, you don't deserve this. This maniac picked up my tablet and was about to walk up the stairs. I snatched it away and rushed to stuff it in my pencil bag. Karen tried to grab the bag, but I pushed myself into a corner. I clutched the bag super hard and started to scream for my mom. Mom is my mother. Mom. What's wrong? You don't need to scream. She saw Karen trying to grab me and ripped her away from me. I just want to say my mom is a big lady. She towers over my dad who is 5 foot 10 and she's not dainty either. Karen immediately went on a tirade about how I was corrupting her son and forcing him to look at my drawings. She shoved the art into my mom's face and she just kind of raised her eyebrows at Karen. My mom then turned back to A. Mom. A. Did she make your brother look at this? A. No. It was hanging up and he saw it. We had the door locked, but I guess he got in. Me. He bit A on the hand too. A showed her the bite and sent A upstairs to get a band-aid from the hall closet. My mom told Karen that she didn't appreciate her behavior and asked her to take B and leave. Karen looked upset and I swear her face went beet red. Karen. Are you kidding me? She scared my baby. Mom. Your son is fine. He wasn't supposed to be down here anyway. The door was locked and he must have forced it open. It was an honest mistake and I would like you and B to please leave. If you're going to act like this, then at least give my son the tablet. He's going to need therapy and the tablet will help him express himself. My mom rolled her eyes. Mom. Fine. She walked over and grabbed a drawing paper tablet and handed it to Karen. Karen looked confused. Then she got angry and slammed the paper onto the ground. No, you dumb jerk. I want the one in her purse. My son needs it more than she ever will. If she's going to be drawing that cursed garbage, then she doesn't deserve it. My mom asked what tablet I had, and I told her that Karen wanted my iPad. She looked surprised for a second, but just turned to Karen and told her to leave again. Karen was fussing and screaming, saying things about how I was disgusting and that my art was inappropriate but my mom threatened to call the police and she just stormed up the stairs. A said she was going to stay and Karen dragged B to the car. My mom set us down and we went over the events. We all eventually ended up laughing and my mom put some antibiotic ointment on A's bite just to make sure it was clean. A is still here and my mom says she can stay in the guest room for as long as she wants. Before anyone asks, my dad is on a business trip and won't be back until Friday. My mom is going to call him tomorrow and tell him what happened just in case Karen tries anything. If anything happens, I'll update. If you bothered to read this, I thank you. Edit to add. So reading the comments, I found people debating things. The reason Karen stayed because of the rain is because the roads flood bad where I live. She wasn't here for hours because of coffee. She and my mom were talking while B was watching TV. Karen and my mom have known each other for two years. They weren't exactly friends, but they've chatted about stuff when me and A hang out. This was the first time they've really gotten into a deep conversation and I'm assuming my mom was too polite to end it. Me and A were using watercolor paint to experiment with color palettes on the printed sheet of paper. I was using red as a possible clothing color and my mom thinks it could look like blood from a quick glance. Speaking of artwork, have you ever done any artwork? And if so, what kind? Please let us know. Watercolors for the win. Am I the jerk for refusing to be my friend's baby's godfather? My wife is from another country and we met a couple in which the husband's wife is from the same country. We are great friends, almost nine years now, done a lot together. Best friends hands down. The husband has no family alive that talks to him. The wife obviously only has the husband as her family here in the US. Well, the wife is pregnant with a baby. For sake of conversation, we will call her Jane. The husband asked me if I could be Jane's godfather. To note, they are Catholic. I was honored. My friend was thrilled and the next day he dropped off an envelope with some papers in it. After he left, I looked and it was a legal contract that I needed to sign in order to be the godfather. Obviously, I thought it was a bit overboard, but gave it a read anyways. 
It has many things I must do as a godfather, such as I must go to every Catholic event in which Jane attends, such as christening, confession, confirmation, etc., which I know are normal events for a Catholic kid's life. Not a big deal. Then we get into ridiculous things. I have to consider becoming Catholic. I must give a gift of at least $500 for each of these events. And on birthdays slash Christmas, gifts must be cash only and over $250. Oh no, it gets worse. I'm expected to save at least $25,000 over Jane's 18 years and set it aside for Jane's future college tuition. Her parents will provide the rest. Seriously? The list goes on to include various things such as being willing to cancel any plans I have if they need me to watch Jane or if they go on vacation. Apparently, Jane can't go. Many of the other things on the list were silly or not a big deal, like spending time with her once a week. I called my friend and said it was nothing personal, but there was no way I would sign it. He got mad and said I'm the only family they have and I should be thankful and honored to be asked. I told him I was honored, but the rules were extreme and ridiculous, especially when it comes to the money involved. He brought up that he knows I am godfather to a niece I have and that I send her money, which I do. I send her $100 a year. In my country, that's a lot of money. I told him there's a big difference between $100 and tens of thousands of dollars over 18 years. He essentially told me that he thought I was a good guy, but it was apparent I was selfish. He has since blocked my number and my email. His wife has too. Mind you, his wife and mine talked nearly every day. Since he ended things, I shredded the papers he gave me and left them in a bag and put it in his mailbox for him, telling him it was a shame he ruined our friendship over ridiculous demands. I told him I forgive him regardless. Lastly, I will note together this couple makes almost $200,000 a year. My wife and I make not even $35,000 a year. So am I the jerk for refusing to be Jane's godfather? Added info below. I should add that while I don't know what the wife's involvement in the contract was, many people that come from her country tend to be married to, let's say, wealthier men here. So they tend to live lavish lives and spend a lot on their kids. Some tend to also look down on small gifts. For example, if you don't have a Michael Kors purse, they judge you. So maybe the money thing was the wife's idea. If someone wants to spend a ton of money, that's up to them. But I don't want to spend a ton of money on a kid that isn't even mine. At least not $25,000. Edit. Wow, this blew up over a matter of hours. I'll try to respond as much as I can. To add some more info based on some responses, I honestly thought the contract was some kind of a prank at first. As I continued reading, it became clear that it was serious. Some still ask what country our wives are from, Philippines. To be clear, not every Filipina is the same way, just as with every country and its people. Though as stated, I don't know the wife's involvement in the contract. Shredding the papers and leaving it for the husband was probably not the best move, but it was a heat of the moment thing. I'd still be the godfather if they asked, without the rules but whether or not they will ever talk to us again is up in the air. Though I don't know if I'd want to be friends with people who flip so quickly, especially with such crazy demands. Thankfully, they don't use Reddit, so I don't have to worry about them seeing this. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you go ahead and be their godparent and sign the paperwork or not? Please let us know. Absolutely not. The nerve of some people. Entitled mom received $7 in exchange for the respect of everyone around her. I work at a sushi restaurant. I actually do love my job. I like to joke around with customers and talk about food. Woman comes in with what I assume are her three kids. Everything is going well. They get the food relatively quickly and they're happy. I'm checking in every now and then, refilling drinks, etc. until the end. One of the rolls they ordered was too sour. They had already eaten half the roll. She wanted a refund. There's only one proper response in this situation. Oh, okay. And remember, you tried something and you didn't like it, these things happen. Restaurants do things differently. There have been plenty of times where I don't like the way that a restaurant has made a dish I liked, but I wasn't going to make a fuss. I don't have to eat the food, but people worked hard to make sure I got it in the first place. She does not hit me with the, oh okay. She's complaining that she's been coming here for 20 years, the place has been open much shorter than that, and that she knows her sushi. And we did it wrong. This is all within earshot of the sushi chefs, who are really good at their job. A little biased because I work there, of course, 
but the sushi is really good. She keeps going. I keep saying, we can't refund it. You already ate it. I'm your waiter. This ain't up to me. She decides she's going for a smoke and then comes back. One of her kids apologized to me. Kid clearly looked embarrassed. I said not to worry and to not think poorly of your mom. The manager that day is one of my friends from college and the reason I have the job in the first place. It's been nice to have the income during lockdown. I feel terrible sending my friend over, but we both know what we're in for. She doesn't want them mistreating me either. My friend also had a rough, rough day on Monday where I was not present with a new hire that wasn't trying to do her job and was making it harder for everybody else. She needed to blow off some steam. We had both agreed to take a shot after we finished work. Neither of us drive to work and I felt like something was going to happen, but nothing happened. After a few more minutes of this woman being extra nasty to her, she just gave up and canceled the $7 roll and told her to keep in mind not to order it if she ever comes back. This is a $7 roll on a $130 check, the single most minor part of the meal. Everything else was $13 or more, and she had to give us a hard time. This woman failed to pick her battles. She had to take a stand on one leg against two strangers who were just following rules and making sense. You can't eat your food and then ask for a refund. I can't stop her from dying on this hill. She pays in cash, they get up to leave, and she gives me a piece of her mind. You shouldn't be so rude, etc, etc. Old Karen having to let me know. But then her kid, not the one who apologized to me earlier, looked at me and said, Forget you. I'm walking by them and holding an empty takeout container. I throw it into the ground hard and walk away. I can't yell at a mom in front of her kids, it just doesn't feel right. I'd feel awful if that was my mom, even if my mom was in the wrong. I'm having a panic attack now, breathing heavy, tears rolling down my face. I have trouble handling words like that, even from strangers and even when I'm definitely in the right. I'm walking around the basement for like 5 minutes, thinking it's safe to return. So I surface. My friend is heated. I think it's me at first and I wouldn't blame her. I threw something and ran away and I was really embarrassed about it. Face wet from tears and feeling awful. She wasn't. She was upset at the customer and she chased her out. I feel bad that happened with the kids there, but she stood up for me and I felt really good about it. Even though I was apologizing and very embarrassed at my behavior, my friend standing up for me when I was upset touched my heart. I've blown up at people before, everybody has, but I don't think I've gotten that kind of support before. I've just apologized for being angry even when I felt like I was right. There was a table of four young ladies right next to the problem table, but the other waitress took over for me because I was shaken up, crying a little, breathing heavily. This gave me angry hiccups, which just made me cry and breathe heavier. When that table left, they left a good tip. I made sure to apologize. That wasn't on the restaurant, that's on me. I shouldn't be childish and throw things no matter what. But all I heard from one of them was, no, you were right, she was a jerk, and I felt a little better. Am I the jerk for not giving my girlfriend equity of my condo? My girlfriend and I have lived together since August of 2019 in a rental condo. My income is $320,000 a year and hers is $37,000 a year, and we split our monthly rent of $2,300 so that I pay $1,600 and she pays $700. I pay for our internet cost of $100 a month and we have no other shared utilities since the unit has heating and water included. My girlfriend works about 30 to 35 hours per week at a job that I got her through my connections and I work between 60 to 100 hours per week working two jobs. As a side effect of this, she takes care of most of the household tasks and cooks most of our meals. She spends about one and a half hours per day doing household chores and cooking. Now, I've recently purchased a condo with money that I pulled together during the last year or so. Sadly, lockdown keeping us at home let me save up a decent down payment. I also was able to buy a car last year to help us get around safely during lockdown. We also used that car to teach my girlfriend how to drive. The condo I bought was $970,000 and is in one of the most desirable neighborhoods in our city. And it's a 1,000 square foot, two bedroom plus den, two bathroom unit. An upgrade from our current rental unit that's about 750 square feet, which is a one plus den with two bathrooms. The monthly cost for my new condo will be $4,350, mortgage plus maintenance fees. My girlfriend and I plan to move into my new condo on July 1st when I close. 
My girlfriend had insisted on paying rent in the new place since she knows the cost for me will be much higher than our current living situation. We agreed that she could pay $700 a month so that her costs don't change from our current rent. My girlfriend didn't help with a down payment and she isn't on the mortgage or the title. I had a family lawyer put together a cohabitation agreement to ensure that the condo would remain mine alone. Now, my girlfriend is saying that she thinks she deserves some equity in the property based on the rent that she would pay. It doesn't make sense to me. She pays rent now to our landlords and doesn't expect any ownership or equity, so why would I agree to give her equity in a condo that I own? Am I being the jerk here? Edit. Adding a few additional details. 1. We agreed that in 3-4 to four years, we would buy a detached home together, when she had had time to save up money to contribute to the down payment, and we would jointly own that property together, proportionally. 2. Our city is so expensive that she cannot buy a property on her income anywhere, not even within a 3-hour drive of the city. 3. If single, she would be paying $1,600 for rent for her own place, or $1,000 for a room somewhere normal. For $700 a month, she could only get a room in a sketchy area with multiple roommates. 4. We will likely get married in 2-3 to three years or so. 5. She chooses not to get a better job with a higher income because her current job is very relaxed. She regularly watches movies or takes naps while she is on the clock for work and so she doesn't want to get a different job that pays more because she's concerned she will have to actually work the hours that are expected. 6. The cohabitation agreement also includes a goodwill payment clause that would give her $10,000 per year we are together to a limit of $100,000 at 10 years. This way, she would not be left with nothing if our relationship ended. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. Please do tell us what you think. I can't wait to read your opinion. So we're not allowed to throw snowballs in the winter? This is a story that my father is always fond of repeating, describing events that happened when he was a teen. First, a little bit of a setup. Living in Norway, especially back in the day, the winters are long, cold, and of course filled with snow. This means that most schools and other clubs, activities, etc., that deal with kids and teens have very strict rules about what one is allowed to do or not to do when it comes to said snow. Especially when it comes to snowballs, those rules tend to be very strict. Since there's a lot of snow and temperature changes, etc., there's always a lot of gravel and such used to fight the buildup of ice, etc., which can potentially make the snowballs quite dangerous projectiles. So the rules make sense, to some extent at least. My dad had become very familiar with those rules as he had been caught red-handed throwing snowballs on several occasions. This had caused him to receive an ultimatum. No more breaking the rules or you will be suspended. To make sure he knew what the rules were, he was told to study them carefully. Important to the story. Setup done. One summer, mid-June, there's a massive hailstorm. So big, in fact, that by the time it's over, the landscape looks like it's winter, with piles of sloppy, icy snow everywhere. Going outside, the adults made sure to remind the kids about the snow rules. They made a point to stop my father in the door, telling him, You know the rules. We will keep an eye on you and expect you to follow them to the letter. Cue malicious compliance. You see, the rules were very specific. They specifically stated what you were and weren't allowed to do with snow in the winter. Every single rule started with, in the winter, you are not allowed to. As my father had been forced to study the rules extensively, he knew perfectly well what the rules stated and went outside, gathering up a piece of snow and hurling it at one of his friends. This, of course, sparked a massive snowball fight, after which he was led up to the principal's office. Principal, I assume you know why you're here. Father, not really, no. I don't see how I did anything wrong. Principal, I thought we made things very clear when it comes to what would happen to you if you were to break the rules one more time. Pulls out the book of rules and flips to the page. Principal, mind reading me this rule? Pointing to the rule about snowballs. Father, during the winter, you are not allowed to throw snowballs. A whole bunch of text specifying what you were not allowed to throw at, where you were not allowed to throw, etc. Principal. So, now that you've had a refresher, what do you have to say for yourself? Father. What time of year is it? Principal can't think of anything to say. My father got off without any further argument, even getting a commendation from his teacher about his clever way to think outside of the box. 
The rules were changed to be a lot less specific about the time of year a few weeks later, though it wasn't very likely to ever happen again, as hailstorms during the summer are a very rare occurrence in this part of the country at least. I got called in for emergency at the wrong hospital. Background I had been a doctor at a very reputed hospital in my country about three years back, well before lockdown. I had worked there for a year before my husband and I had decided to move to another country. I had resigned a few months before the travel to take care of the visa and all of the other stuff we would need to do before moving to another country. During this time, I would still keep getting calls from the hospital to check on this or that patient and I would politely tell them that I don't work for them anymore. I hadn't exactly worked in the ER but had been the first one to be called in case of any of the issues with the patients that had already been admitted in the wards till the actual attending doctor of the patient came in. Each ward had its own duty mobile phone and that's where the calls came from. The calls had happened very frequently and every time I would tell the nurse who had called that I didn't work there anymore. I was very polite and nice as I had really loved working there and though I didn't anymore, seeing the calls reminded me of that time. As the time approached for us to fly, I stopped attending the calls, hoping they would eventually stop. It's been now two years after we moved and we are now in a country with a completely different time zone. Though I have a new local number, I still keep the old number from my country active. I still occasionally see a missed call from the hospital displayed on my phone when I wake up. I can't receive the calls due to 1. Huge roaming costs, 2. The calls came mostly when I'm asleep, due to the time differences, and 3. The phone is almost always on silent. However, a few days back in the evening, I noticed there were 5 missed calls, all from the hospital. I had received them during the afternoon, which meant they were made when it was late midnight in my country. This alarmed me, as usually I only get one missed call. That too, during the morning hours of my country. I immediately topped up the mobile and made a call to the hospital. I asked for the in-charge nurse of that particular ward. Since my number was still stored as the contact physician, the nurse who attended immediately called for the in-charge nurse and said, Dr. OP is called. I think she was probably a junior nurse, as she also seemed a bit tense. As soon as the in-charge nurse was on call, I explained the situation to her. I told her that I had received several missed phone calls in an emergency hour, but didn't work there anymore. She was surprised and immediately apologized. I explained to her I had calls, not because it was an inconvenience to me, because it wasn't, but if they tried to reach out to a doctor who doesn't work there in cases of emergencies and expected them to come, it could cost the patient their life. I had never received five missed calls before and hoped that the patient for whom I was called in for was all right. She assured me that everything was okay and thanked me for letting her know. She apologized again and told me she would delete my number immediately. I thanked her and hung up. Somehow, this time I was sure I wouldn't receive any more calls. That kind of made me a bit sad in a weird way, but patients' lives matter more. I honestly hope they get it all sorted out and call the right doctor from now on. $127 Dine-In Dash So I'm a server, and one of my tables walked out. This is going to be long, but please read. I need advice. Background The servers are supposed to pay for walkouts when they happen where I work. I've had to pay for things in the past because I messed up, and I admit they were my fault. I've worked there for two years now, so I'm well aware of the rule. Story time. It's getting close to the end of the night, and I had to use the bathroom. Had to go number two, which means I was going to be gone for a little. I say to two of my fellow servers, I have to use the bathroom. Can you guys please watch table F1? And they say okay. So I go to the bathroom and come back a little bit later. The assistant manager let me know I had a table. Another server got the table's drink order for me, so I'm just waiting as the assistant manager makes the drinks, and my general manager comes up to me and says F1 haven't been paid for. I notice the two people from the table are gone. Before I went to the bathroom, the table asked for their check, so I go to see if they left the money, but it was empty. Me. There's no money. GM. Well, you have to pay for it. Me. I don't think I should have to pay for this, because I asked two other servers to watch my table. GM. You signed the paper, so you have to pay. You know the rules. Me. I'm sorry, but I'm not paying for it. This wasn't my fault. I walk away so I can continue to take care of my other table, then maybe 15 minutes later, I pull my assistant manager to the side. Me. Look, I follow the rules. You guys, my managers, have always said if you step out, 
let someone know so they can watch your table, and that's exactly what I did, so I'm not paying for it. Assistant Manager Well, that's not fair to everyone else, and you signed the paper. Me GM said that too, and I don't know what paper you're talking about. Assistant Manager The paper that says you have to pay for walkouts regardless of the reason. It was passed out a while ago. Me I never signed that because I was never given one. Well, it has to be paid for. It was your table at the end of the day. It's your responsibility. Me. I was having a human bodily function. How can I be held responsible when I let others know? Well, you didn't tell me. But we can't put you on the schedule until it's paid for. Me. Well, this might be the last time we work together because I'm not paying for it. In the end, my GM gave me a speech about how I've been working there for two years and that I'm a good employee and I should get more trustworthy people to watch my tables. Secretly, he took some of the money off the order and told me not to tell the other servers, but I still have to pay $100 overtime like a payment plan. I just want to know if I was in the wrong for not wanting to pay it. Obviously, the other two servers could have been held accountable as well, but I didn't want to have my coworkers hate me. At this point, I'm just going to pay it off and work until I find a new job, because this place is far from perfect. But this whole thing has completely upset me. Entitled Parent Tries Taking My Emotional Support Dog I have pretty bad PTSD, and I also have a tick disorder along with anxiety, so me plus people don't work out. My dog is completely trained and is meant for panic attacks, may I add. So I'm walking through the mall with my large lab mix named Tiger. He has his vest on, which clearly states he is a service dog. He was walking in our normal position, him on my right, slightly behind so he can watch me. He doesn't mind kids, so if I'm having a good day, I will have him sit and let the kids play with him. I go to that mall quite a lot, so I see the same kids often and I've honestly bonded with a few of the families. Enter the entitled mother. I don't remember ever talking to her, so when she walked right up to me, I was quite confused. I wasn't having a very good day, so while I was standing, doing I don't know what, Tiger was laying between me and doing slow circles because that makes me feel safe. Excuse me? May my son pet your dog? She says in the Karen voice. You know what I mean. I'm sorry, but he's a service dog and he's on duty, so he can't be pet right now. Or something like that. I said this in my sweetest dealing with kids voice because I didn't want to seem like I was arrogant or anything. I went back to doing whatever I was doing. Tiger puts his paws on my thigh when something's wrong and I immediately look down. The small kid, probably around four to six, was petting him. Excuse me. Can you tell your son not to touch my dog? I again used a polite voice. Why? I've seen you let other kids pet your dog. She snapped at me. I could feel the panic attack building up. I started shaking slightly, but was able to calm myself pretty fast. Mommy, can I have the doggy? My head snapped towards the kid who was tugging on the leash and vest. Of course, honey. How much for the dog? Um, he's not for sale. As I said, he's a service dog and is trained specifically by me for me. He was only partially trained when we adopted him and I finished his training. So, my son needs a service dog. He's clearly blind. In my brain, hold up, this doesn't add up. Ma'am, if he did need one, you would have to have a dog trained specifically for him because my dog is trained for PTSD. She huffed, grabbed her son and walked off. I thought that was the end of it and walked to the food court. I sat with my pretzel and went through some schoolwork, I think. After a couple of minutes, I heard the same annoying Karen voice. Okay, son, so distract that lady. I was confused, but for some reason went back to what I was doing. Excuse me, miss. Yes? What kind of doggy do you have? Um, well, he's a lab. I didn't know what to say, because what should I say? He's like six. Out of nowhere, I hear Tiger yelp and immediately look to see where he was at. And there was Karen, holding his lead with one hand and his vest with the other. He was now about three feet away from me, so he was clearly uncomfortable. Give me my dog! I was definitely way too calm for the situation I was in. He's my dog! Someone called the police! This crazy lady is trying to take my service dog! I was shaking and breathing heavy because of one of my major triggers as people yelling at me. I was seriously upset. Not only did she steal my dog from me, but she then called me crazy. Ma'am, give me my dog. Do you even know his name? I'm still shaking and somehow managed to keep a stable and firm voice. This is my dog, Ginger. Tiger didn't even move when he heard that. He was still standing here being handled by this nut job. 
I whistled because that's what I usually used to call him. Tiger, come. He pulls hard on her to get to me and dragged her to the ground. She looked like she was about to explode. He sat between me again and I grabbed his lead. See, my dog. She pulls herself up and dragged my dog back to her again, smacking my arm in the process. She hit right where one of my worst scars are, and at that point, I lost all composure. Give me my dog! I didn't care about being kind anymore. She didn't budge. It's my dog. I'm calling the police. Enter Tyler and Sarah, a sweet younger couple who me and my family know quite well. Um, OP? Who is that woman holding Tiger? A psycho jerk that stole my dog. I'm shaking hard and was on the verge of tears because, you know, PTSD. Sarah walked over and worked on trying to calm me down while Tiger was dealing with Thunder Jerk. Give me the dog back before I have to do something I will regret. Fun fact, Tyler's in the army. Don't touch me. I'll call my husband. He's a lieutenant. Where at? Because I'm a first lieutenant. She completely stopped talking, handed over the dog, grabbed her poor son, and booked it out of here. Sadly, there's no happy ending really, but if anything changes, I'll update you. By the way, I took Tyler and Sarah out for ice cream after that incident. I no longer leave Tiger's lead laying around if I'm not holding it. Speaking of dogs, do you have a dog? And if so, what's their name? Please let us know. We've got a teacup poodle named Karen Jr. I love her so much. Flight attendant is told to get an in-flight movie that is interesting. This malicious compliance belongs to my beautiful wife, but since it's from many decades ago, from a time before we knew each other, we will call her classy flight attendant here. First, the usual disclaimers. I'm on computer, so completely responsible for the formatting. English is my first and third language, and my mother was a school teacher, so I'm also completely responsible for my use of spelling and grammar. The setup. At the time of this event, Classy flight attendant is one of the top tier flight attendants for her country's national airline. Strictly speaking, any of their flights that do not involve parts in the USA or its territories are not required to follow all FAA rules. However, whenever they fly to ports regulated by the FAA, they are expected to follow those rules to the T. Of course, it doesn't always work out that way in practice. On this occasion, classy flight attendant has just landed from Europe at her home airport in South America only to learn that she's being turned around for a round trip to New York City. She protests. By the time she lands in New York, she will be well outside FAA rest period rules with all the consequences that could follow. Her supervisors don't care. They need her on that flight right now, and away she goes. But she knows the flight to New York isn't the real problem. It's the return trip that will be pure misery. Her compatriots flying home from New York tend to be extremely entitled. They're coming from New York. That makes them somebody now. They will refuse drink service when offered, and then when the flight attendant is three or four rows further along, push the call button and order a drink. They will keep an attendant hopping back and forth the whole flight for stupid little things, many of them things they could actually do for themselves. Classy flight attendant is tired and knows that dealing with this entitled crowd on the return trip is going to be the worst. As they get into New York, she's told to check out an in-flight movie for the return trip. The suggestion is made to make it interesting enough to keep the passengers too busy to order the flight crew around that much. Cue the malicious compliance. As she looks over the options and finds the perfect film, it will keep the passengers riveted to their seats. Frankly, given the nature of the film, she isn't even sure why it exists in the cartridge format used on planes at this time. Perhaps because the format is also used on some yachts and cruise ships, she orders it. Once on board, she keeps it secret. She knows that once she pops it in and it starts to play, the systems in use at that time cannot be stopped. But any time before that, she could be thwarted. Mid-flight, as the plane is well out over the ocean on its way south, she pops it in. Airport 77. For those who don't know, this film is about a plane that crashed in the ocean. The results are immediate and absolute. While there are many white knuckles, no one seems inclined to press their call buttons and classy flight attendant has a very quiet, uninterrupted rest of the remainder of the flight home. The aftermath. As she is deboarding, one old lady is heard saying that she will never fly National Airline again. When called on the carpet for her movie choice, classy flight attendant feigns ignorance, claiming to have thought it was the much more comical airplane and that the name was lost in translation. She is given a three-day suspension, which is for her a much-needed rest. 
Oh, and she will never be allowed to pick the in-flight movie ever again. The keys are in that box. A little backstory to get you caught up. My father was a welder at a pulp and paper mill on maintenance with a union. There were around 500 people who worked here at the time, mid to late 80s. On my dad's crew, there was a man they called Squirrel because he would take anything small enough to carry and take it home. Some of the things were specialized tools made for a certain machine and they would have to be ordered in again at the company's expense. I guess there wasn't much the mill could do because somehow the union backed him. It wasn't long before my father's tools started going missing. He knew where to look and found them in Squirrel's toolbox and some scattered on his workbench. Squirrel was an average sized man, around 5'9 to 5'10, but my father was a huge man standing at 6'5 and around 250 pounds, so Squirrel didn't say a word. He was too scared to. My father reported this to the union rep and the main office and was told that they will investigate. Squirrel was given a one-week paid suspension while the investigation went on. They found many of the missing things in his locker, lunchbox, toolbox, etc. Somehow, he got the union to back him again and was allowed to come back to work at the end of his suspension. My father grabbed his mobile welder and went to Squirrel's area and welded together a giant metal box. He took everything he could identify as Squirrel's and put it in the box and welded a top on it. He said he used 5 8 stainless to make it out of. He then got the help of one of his work buddies to lift the box and dad welded it to the bathroom of the I-beam on the ceiling, about 20 feet in the air. The day Squirrel came back, he was looking for all of his things but couldn't find it at all. He asked everyone he could but no one said a word except, I take care of my tools, maybe you should take better care of yours. This went on for a couple of hours until Squirrel went into the main office to complain saying someone stole everything of his. The shop steward and Squirrel walked into the maintenance shop to ask the people in there where his things were. Dad stood up and walked up close, and knowing him, he was towering over Squirrel, and said something along the lines of, Squirrels like to climb to store their stuff. Are you sure you didn't climb the I-beam and put your stuff up there? I guess the look of, oh no, on the shop steward's face was almost too good. But the look of pure horror on Squirrel's face was my dad's favorite part of this story. He would laugh just as hard at every telling when he got to this part. Squirrel went into his work area and looked up. He saw the box up there. He tried to get anyone's help to get it down, but everyone seemed to have important things to do and can't at the moment. Squirrel took a day and a half working alone to get his things from the box and to remove the box from where it was welded. My father said not a thing ever went missing again and Squirrel worked there another 10 years or more until the mill was shut down. I can say I believe him, because one night staying at his place, I got drunk and was thinking about going home. He went to the basement and made a little box and welded my keys in it. I got them back the next day. I miss my father and his stories. I hope this qualifies as pro. Have you ever had someone take things that belong to you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. You take my sanity by making me listen to these stories all day. Am I the jerk for leaving a family gathering and insisting mother-in-law apologize over M&Ms? My wife, 34 female, and I, 31 female, have two wonderful kids who are both four, they're twins. They were conceived with my wife's eggs and a known donor, and I carried slash birthed them. Both kids ended up being practical clones of my wife, so it's pretty clear to everyone who contributed the genetic material. My in-laws had everyone together at their house earlier this month. We've all had our shots, and the weather was so nice that we had a barbecue. My kids were playing outside with their cousins, and sister-in-law and mother-in-law and I were chatting in the kitchen. At one point, my two run inside from playing and ask if they can have some M&Ms that they see on the counter. I tell them, no, we'll be eating in 15 minutes. You can have some after dinner. They run back out, and mother-in-law excuses herself to go outside. A little bit later, sister-in-law and I get the call that the food is ready, so we go outside, and I see my kids each have a little cup full of M&Ms that they are eating. I tell my kids that they knew they were not supposed to be eating those, and I took away the cups. Mother-in-law comes over and says that she gave them the M&Ms, and that they can have them. To which I replied, no they can't, it's dinner time, you were there when I told them no. Mother-in-law says again that they can have some chocolate, it's fine and tries to take the cups out of my hands. We go back and forth with no, yes, no for a minute,
prompting wife to start walking over to us, just in time to hear mother-in-law say in front of my kids, I'm saying it's okay. They aren't even your kids. They're your wives. Just give them the chocolate. Wife had mother-in-law repeat herself and said something like, Absolutely not. We're leaving. I put the M&Ms on the nearest table, grabbed both my kids, who were now softly crying, and started to pack our stuff. The whole event erupted into chaos. Father-in-law screaming about the disrespect of us leaving. Grandmother crying. Brother-in-law and sister-in-law arguing with father-in-law. Mother-in-law crying that her only daughter is abandoning her. It was a mess. After a couple hours at home, the kids seemed okay, but mother-in-law saying I'm not their mom really scared them. Wife spent about four hours on rotating phone calls with all of her family, from father-in-law screaming at her, mother-in-law crying over how we took her grandkids away over M&Ms and made her out to be the bad grandma, brother-in-law trying to get in the drama, grandmother depressed saying she would pass without seeing her great-grandkids again. Wife's message to all of them was that mother-in-law needed to apologize to me and to our kids for what she said. We made it clear that we would have no problem spending time with grandmother or brother-in-law's family, but we would not bring the kids around mother-in-law until she apologized. As you can guess, the apology has not happened, but the phone calls of guilt trips, yelling, and crying have not let up. I feel an apology is not even a big deal, and at this point, mother-in-law is making the choice not to see her grandkids. I want to hold firm, but I know how hard this all is on my wife, even if I really don't think it's my fault. Am I the jerk for insisting on an apology? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or mother-in-law? Please let us know. If mother-in-law has the nerve to say something like that, then the babies don't need to be around her in the first place. Two months in the customer service job and it finally happened. I work for the company that employs electricians for small jobs. Part of my job is to answer the phone, take their information, type a quick summary of the job, and then open the work order for the electrician which they will then use to contact the client and do the requested work. So the municipal elections are happening and it is Friday afternoon. Suddenly I get a call from a new client who tells me that the light fixture at the polling place nearby has a light fixture that is not working. The light that is not working is located right above the booth. After getting all the basic information, the call starts pretty much like they all do. The people are not able to see the numbers they are writing on the tickets. Can you send an electrician to fix the lighting? She says in a flustered tone. Sure, ma'am. Since this seems to be urgent, I can give you the information of the electrician who is currently nearby working another job. There's also another electrician who is currently here at the office. I can ask if they're free to take a work order right now. At this point, I'm interrupted. Yes, this is very urgent. Go and talk to the one who is there right now. We are located about 15 minutes away from the polling location, so this might be faster. Considering that the electrician who is currently on the job can't really just leave to do another job. So I take the phone with me and head towards the break area to talk to the other electrician. After walking around the warehouse, I find the electrician talking on his phone, most likely with another client. I do some gesturing to him, asking if he's free after this call. When I get the answer, I update the lady who is on the phone with me. The electrician is speaking to another client right now, but as soon as he finishes his call, he can call you and at this point I'm interrupted again. Just take his phone and tell him this is an emergency. The election is surely more important. There is, and I'm being serious here, a 10 second silence as I'm feeling confused. After collecting my thoughts and realizing that she's being serious, I finally answer. I'm sorry ma'am, but I'm cut short yet again. At this point, her talking gets so fast and even more confusing. There's a lot of talking about how I would not want our company to end up on the local newspaper. She actually mentioned some bigger ones too, but oh well, for not offering the proper service and thus ruining the election. After more silence and awkward answers, I finally give her the information of the electrician who is working nearby, with the promise of also following through with the one who is currently on the phone. She also asks for contact info of my supervisor, which I also give her, because I have to. So the phone call ends and the electrician comes over to the office after finishing his call. I give him the summary of the job and as I'm doing that, the electrician who is with me gets a call from my supervisor. He collects his equipment and leaves to do the work order at the polling place. After an hour or so, he returns from his job and I ask him how it went. Apparently, the lady had contacted pretty much every company in the area that offers the electrician services. 
So when our electrician arrived at the venue, there were a total of six guys from different companies in already running around fixing a single light fixture. In the end, the light bulb was not screwed in tightly enough. The janitor of the venue had changed all of the light bulbs before the booths opened, leaving that single light bulb loose. What I heard is that the woman had threatened multiple local companies at the site about their slow response and unprofessional behavior. I know that the municipal elections are a big deal, but I have never before thought that the organizers are under so much stress that they would act like this. I guess it was just a matter of time before I encountered a customer like this. But the scale of this. Wow. Edit. I did drop by the guy who writes our invoices as I was leaving for the day. All the companies will, most likely, charge all their working hours rounded up because of all the time they wasted. What surprised me though was that the organizers told everyone at the site to direct their invoices to the venue owner. Apparently, it was his fault for not following through with the preparations properly. Whether he is the one who has to pay for this fiasco, or if he then forwards it to the organizers after, is something we will probably never find out. Not putting in enough hours, you say? A few years ago, I worked as a field engineer for a call recording company. I worked primarily with 911 agencies and would integrate recording systems with radio and phone systems to record the calls and radio traffic. If you've heard a 911 call on the news from one of a few states along the East Coast, there's a good chance I built and installed that system. As part of our company's policy, we would do preventative maintenance every six months. This was where we went on site, tested everything was functioning properly, and showed some value in our maintenance contracts through FaceTime with the customers. After some years, I had climbed the ladder to being the lead engineer, installer, and trainer. I trained most of the other engineers and techs within the company along with performing my normal duties. I had also installed the vast majority of the systems I was doing maintenance on and was extremely familiar with them. A maintenance visit took me around an hour where it took the new guys four to five hours and I would usually knock out two to three maintenance visits in a single day. I had literally triple the numbers as the next closest tech. As often happens, eventually the company was bought out. The new owner came in and presented himself as very metrics focused. The problem was that he didn't understand what we did in the field, so his metrics weren't always good ones. Eventually, I got written up and put on a performance improvement plan. The reason? Days I didn't have to drive far, I would finish three maintenance visits and still be home in less than six hours. Again, my actual performance metrics were legitimately triple the next closest tech and most days I worked well over eight hours when driving was included. But instead of looking at those metrics, he used time as his only metric and focused solely on the shortest days. And unfortunately for me, I objectively worked less time than anyone else. Now for the malicious compliance. Instead of scheduling the way I had previously, I started scheduling to ensure I hit eight hours a day every day. Previously, I had started at a customer site at 9 a.m. whether it was one hour away or five, so would get up at whatever time that day required. I would also try to knock out multiple customers in the same area on the same trip to save driving time on longer days. Some days I would drive 12 hours total, knock out three maintenance visits, taking another few hours, and have a total day of 15 plus hours. Afterwards, I left for sites at exactly 8 a.m. and tried to get home at exactly 5 p.m. For those sites that were five hours away, can't do them without a hotel room. Instead of costing a full tank of gas and a single day's wages for three clients, it now costs the company the same amount of gas, three to four nights in a hotel, and multiple days of my salary. For closer sites that I didn't need a hotel, I would make sure I didn't leave too soon to get home at exactly 5 p.m., so would sit in a server room playing games on my phone for a few hours. If sites were close enough, I would still try to knock out two or sometimes three, but if time was the metric, I was going to make sure I worked as closely to eight to five as possible without doing anything detrimental to a customer. Overall, I was trying to make a point to show that while I may have been meeting the time metric, I was actually doing less work by meeting that metric. We did employee reviews every quarter, so when my next review came around three months later, I tried to bring it up. Instead, the new owner praised me for working harder and ignored that I was doing significantly less work. During that meeting, I tried showing that it was costing the company more and I was achieving less by meeting that metric instead of an actual performance metric. But somehow, despite my spreadsheets showing costs, site visits, completed maintenance, and everything else, he refused to understand it. He kept praising how my work ethic had improved and didn't want me to change anything or go back. 
so I didn't change a thing and coasted at that job for the next few years. I don't work here and neither does my bag. For those who aren't aware, Aldi is a chain of mid-sized grocery stores. They rebranded themselves a few years ago as a sort of middle ground between a standard grocer and Whole Foods with options healthier than, say, Walmart, but not full-on super health craze like Whole Foods. But one of the defining characteristics of Aldi is that you pay for your cart. There's a device that locks up all the carts together, so when you need one, you insert a quarter into the device, decoupling it from the next cart. When you finish shopping, you return the cart to the line and recouple it, at which point you can then remove your quarter. However, Aldi does not offer a similar function for anything else. Not hand-carried baskets, and definitely not for bags. This is where our story begins. I do most of my grocery shopping at Walmart, but I do hit the Aldi nearby for a few small things. Usually, I don't need to bother with a cart due to the low volume. Instead, I bring in my own foil-lined insulated bag. I have the bags because I live out in the country, so when I get takeout or buy cold stuff at the store, the stuff is still hot or cold respectively by the time I get home 15 minutes later. When I go to Aldi, I just bring the insulated bag in with me, put items into it while I shop, tell the cashier how many of each item I have so I don't even need to unload them, and easy peasy, no carts required. As I left the store, had just removed my mask as I passed through the doors, a few weeks ago, our dear Karen saw me with the bag in hand. I hadn't zipped it up yet as I was still messing with the mask and had some fridge cold stuff from Walmart I was going to put into the bag in the truck before I started home. Karen must have seen that it had the foil insulation with purchased items and this is what ensued. Karen, hey you, snapping her fingers. Why do they always snap? You. I turned to face her. Yes? Karen, give me that when you're done. Points at my bag. Me. Ma'am, these are my groceries. I won't be done with them until I eat them in the coming weeks. I know that. What do I look like? A moron? Well, I mean the bag, idiot. Me. Ma'am, this bag is also mine. Yeah, it's yours now. But when you bring it back to get your coin, then I want it. Me. Again, this is my bag, not the stores. Aldi doesn't have bags. They only do the quarter thing for the carts. B.S. They have bags at the checkout. I can see them from here. Yeah, those are for sale, not temporary use. And this bag isn't from Aldi. I got it on Amazon. Whatever. You should still bring it to me. I only need it for a few minutes, and I don't have a quarter for the carts anyway. Oh, so we're in one of those situations. Gotcha. I'm in my current military job. I'm an instructor, and one of the skills we master during this assignment is the art of staring in silence with a completely blank look on our face. It's a great tool to force students to engage in discussion, embracing the silence until one of them gets so uncomfortable that they start talking about anything just to break the silence. We also use continuous questions to challenge students to delve deeper into topics, like lots of why and how questions that force them to come to their own conclusions. Me, stares in silence. Karen, after almost 10 seconds. Well? Me, well what? Karen, what are you waiting for? Go unload your groceries and bring me that bag. She was approaching shrill by the end of that sentence. Me, why would I do that? Because I need that bag to shop. Why is that my problem? What are you talking about? Why is your lack of bags or coins something I need to help you with? Karen, visibly struggling with the effort of thinking. Because, because... Her head cocks to the side a bit, then she rallies back into indignation mode. Ugh. Just get out of my face, you little jerk. Me. Weren't you the one who stopped me to demand I give you my personal property? Karen, devolving into guttural utterances that barely resembled a spoken language. Me. Still hiding behind my stoic instructor face. Karen. You people are what's wrong with this country. She stormed off into the store without a cart. Me. Have a wonderful day as I wave at her. Oh, the joys of malicious passivity. Am I the jerk for not responding to employers' emails outside of working hours? I have just started working for a huge organization. It's set on 40 acres of land and employs roughly 1,000 members of staff. It's not a theme park, but it is an attraction. I have not long graduated university and will be going back to study my master's in September. This is a temporary, minimum wage, general dog's body, customer service type role. The contract runs out at the end of August. 
I thought this is an excellent opportunity to earn a bit of money between studying. One of the things I've noticed though is that they constantly send out emails, between 6 to 10 emails a day, every day. Some are just news bulletins, others are blog posts and updates from the directors and other various departments, etc. However, some of them are important and require a response, such as acknowledging changes to policies and procedures, and due to the nature and size of the organization, this appears to happen a lot. The emails contain documents comprised of pages and pages of information that needs to be acknowledged, understood, signed, and returned. Before I begin explaining the issue, I feel I must inform you that due to the size of the organization, staff are authorized to have their mobile phones on our person during our shifts. So anyway, having returned to work after a couple of days off, I was collared by one of the supervisors who asked why I haven't been responding to emails recently as they've sent out several important emails, including follow-ups. I responded that I've been off for a few days and was just about to read through them now and take action accordingly. They then proceeded to tell me, in a rather condescending tone, that the emails can be actioned in our free time outside of work. I respectfully said, but that's my free time. They were then pretty adamant that it's too much reading etc to be done during our working hours when I'm employed to work. I was like, no offense, but I've been employed on minimum wage and am not a salaried member of the team who is reasonably expected to spend so much time conducting work tasks outside of work. It's now become a whole issue and I'm being made to feel like I am not a team player. I can't help but feel like I'm not being unreasonable. So am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their supervisor? Please let us know. You want me to be a team player? You better pay me like a team player. Karen tells me I need to stop mowing my lawn. To set the scene, I live in a relatively quiet neighborhood and all of our neighbors take great pride in keeping their lawns and the appearance of their houses. So it's common to hear lawnmowers, weed whackers, saws, etc. On Saturday afternoon, I decided that I would mow our front and back lawns for my parents as they were preparing dinner and I thought it would be a nice thing to do. I had already finished mowing our backyard, which took about 15 to 20 minutes and had moved on to our front yard. When I walked into the front yard, I did notice my elderly neighbor, she's like 97, sitting outside with her daughter. While in the middle of mowing the front lawn, the daughter comes up to me and said something. I couldn't hear her because the mower was running. So I turned it off and asked her to repeat herself. She then says, I don't know if you noticed, young lady, but we are trying to sit and enjoy our Saturday afternoon, and you are disrupting us with your mowing. I apologized, and I thought that was the end of the ordeal, so I started the mower back up. The daughter starts yelling at me that I have zero respect for the elderly or my neighbors. I told her I would be done in 10 minutes, but she just wanted me to stop and come back and finish in two hours two hours. I once again told her that I would finish mowing now as I only had half of the lawn left and she blew up once again. I then told her, me mowing for another 10 minutes will not hurt and you can go back inside or just wait for me to be done. I never complain when you mow yours at 7 in the morning. Now please get off of our lawn. I thought I was polite but when I told my parents about it they yelled and are upset because now they think that the neighbors will talk poorly about me and our family. I do kind of feel bad now because I could have just waited to do it another time and I may have taken it too far with telling her to get off our lawn. So am I the jerk for continuing to mow against the wishes of an elderly neighbor? Edit. I just looked up my city laws and unfortunately it is legal for her to mow at 7 a.m. Well what would you do in the situation? Would you stop mowing or keep mowing? Please let us know. I'd mow a little bit slower is what I would do. Karen demands I move two cars impounded by the police. This story is from roughly 2013. I was an adjuster for Blizzard Insurance and would go to many tow lots after car accidents and decide if a car was a total loss or send it to a body shop, as well as do the initial write-up of an estimate on repair costs. The tow lot I was at this day also worked with the state police and housed their overflow storage for anything deemed evidence and on hold from release. These vehicles were kept behind a locked gate inside the already fenced gated tow yard. I was there to do an appraisal on two vehicles that had been involved in a minor accident, however both were left unable to drive from the scene due to either multiple flats, lights knocked out, or windows busted. 
I've finished the first vehicle and I've started taking photos of the second vehicle. I have headphones in and I'm listening to the album Calvacade by the Flatliners. Anywho, I see a woman I'd guessed I was around 50 walk up to the police evidence lot and the gate swings open out of the corner of my eye. Not paying much attention as the vehicles I was working with were on the same side of the lot but about 50 meters down from the evidence lot. As my back is turned to this woman, I will hear on refer to as Karen, I take the last couple of photos I need, the last being a photograph of the VIN of the vehicle which is located where the windshield meets the hood, almost on the dash through the windscreen. I hope this makes sense. Karen, out of literally nowhere, grabs both cables to my headphones from behind and rips them out of my ears. Karen, excuse me, why are there two cars in front of mine so I cannot get it out? This lot would stack cars in four or five deep side by side and move them around with a small truck to release them. Me, please don't touch me and I don't think you should be in there and I don't, you shouldn't be listening to music on the job anyway or slacking off taking pictures of other people's belongings. You're probably back here stealing. I attempt to point at the Lizard Insurance logo on my blue jacket, but Karen continues on. Are you going to do your job? Or do I need to call the police because you're refusing to give me my property? Me, have you gone into the office at ABC Towing? No, I saw you here and you need to move these cars so I can get mine and leave. As Karen opens the door and gets into the first car in the ones blocking her. Me, hey, no, you can't go in there. That's police evidence. I use my cell phone to call ABC Towing and inform them. Karen, if you won't move these cars, then I will. Where are the keys? Me, in the office with the employees. At this time, the manager comes running out with one of those weird smartphone slash Nextel style phones in his hand. Manager, hey lady, get the heck out of those cars. They're property of the state police. Manager frantically uses his Nextel to talk to someone. Manager sees the chain used to keep the lot closed has been cut with bolt cutters. Karen was carrying a pair of bolt cutters and had thrown them into her car when she was back at it. Manager and Karen argue back and forth. I intently listen and pay half attention as I finish my duties for work. About 8 to 10 minutes pass and 7 police cars come flying back into the lot. Manager greets the police and explains what's going on, but not after Karen attempts to scream at the police that I had stolen her car from her. Police tell Karen to stand over in a direction he points sending one officer to wait for her. Turns out, the lieutenant was on scene who was in charge of the county's police tow licenses. After getting manager's story, lieutenant comes to me and takes mine. While I'm informing him of what's happened, Karen overhears and starts yelling and attempting to approach me. The officer standing with her grabbed her by her arm. Karen yanked that arm out of the female officer's hand and shoved her. Surprisingly, knocks the officer down. Karen is screaming incoherently as she charges towards me. The lieutenant steps in front of me and with his taser gets her with the most beautiful sound in the world. Karen falls down and skids slightly. They immediately handcuff her. Turns out Karen had walked onto the lot carrying the bolt cutters while I was in the office talking with staff about the two cars I needed to adjust. She had been roaming the lot until she saw me and I happened to be near her car. Karen was charged with too many things to name. I know Karen did jail time, but I'm not sure how long. Years later, the tow company I now own impounded her car for being double parked. She remembered who I was and quietly paid. I know it's your number, but quite some time ago, my girlfriend and I, now my wife of more than 15 years, moved in together and had to set up all of the things, cable, internet, phone, etc. We got our home phone number, our two cell phones, and we were off to the races. Almost immediately, we start getting calls for an establishment that does custom framing and various other art-related things. Let's call them Expo for Art. Of course, we had caller ID and we had friends that would call us, but inevitably, if we didn't recognize the number, it was someone wanting to find out if their order was complete, or their frame was done, or what their hours were, or any of a thousand other questions. I'm sure anyone else who had this happen will recognize this exchange. Sorry, that's no longer their number. This is a residence. Yes, I'm sure. No, I'm not giving you my address. No, I don't know their new number. Yes, I have a phone book, uh, but so do you. 
Eventually, after a thousand of these and changing the messages on our answering machine to say, this is not, and I repeat, this is not Expo for Art. If you are trying to reach Expo for Art, please hang up, look up their number and try that because we aren't them. Eventually, I got my gazillionth call and I asked the person on the other end of the line where they keep getting this number. Well, it's printed on my receipt. I guess I'll just call this other number. Any chance you can give me that number? Thanks. I call it. Hello, Expo for Art. You guys are still giving out my home phone number on your receipts. Yeah, so? Well, stop it. It's been at least a year since you haven't had that number. At least cross it out or something. That's a pain. I'm not making my employees do that. So, you're the manager? I'm the owner. So let me see if I have this right. You, what was your name again? Let's call him Fred. You, Fred, have decided that it's too inconvenient to cross my home phone number off of your receipts. So you're just going to keep giving it out? Yup. What are you going to do? Sue me? Maybe. Whatever. I've got stuff to do. Bye. I called a lawyer. Didn't really have a leg to stand on. I went to the store and asked for Fred. Fred's not here. He's hardly ever here, really. You want me to call him? No, I'm fine. I know this is going to sound odd, but is there any chance I can see one of your receipts? She picks up a receipt book and shows it to me. Sure enough, it's got my phone number at the top above another one. I say, I thought so. I couldn't get you at the other number. Some guy yelled at me and I don't have my old receipt, so I had to come down here. We've been having that happen a lot. Ever since Fred decided we didn't need two phone lines, but he had just bought like 20 boxes of these other receipt books and business cards and he's too cheap to buy more until they run out. I'd hate to be that guy. Yeah, that's gotta suck. So I went home and hatched my evil plan. Next phone number I didn't recognize. Hello, Expo for Art. Hi, this is Mary Smith. I dropped off a thing last week to be framed. Is it ready? Let me check. Yep, we finished it this morning. I hope you don't mind, but we decided to upgrade the matting because of the weight of the price. It's the same color and won't be charging you for it since it was my decision. Oh, thank you. I'll be down to pick it up later today. What time do you close? I look down at the business card with my number and the hours clearly marked 11 to 4. Take your time. We'll be here until 7. Thank you so much. Can you tell me how much that was? $19.99, ma'am, plus tax, so $21.39. Wow, that's cheap. Are you sure? Of course. If anyone has a problem, tell them you talked to Fred. Okay, see you around 6. See you then. Thank you for calling Expo for Art. For weeks, I kept giving out completely random information. How much is a 36 by 48 matted frame? Let's say $24.99. Wow, that's cheap. How much to have it done custom how they want it? Custom is an extra $10, so $34.99. Wow, that's cheap. I'll be right down. What was your name? Fred. See you in 10, Fred. How much to have the entire front page of the New York Times mounted and framed? $33.99, unless you want our special proprietary newspaper frame and mat service. Only $49.99 and guaranteed for life. Only at Expo for Art. Tell them Fred sent you. I can only imagine the number of upset people who showed up to pick up orders that weren't ready and when they finally were, were given a price way higher than what Fred had told them over the phone. Eventually, someone let slip up that they called the number on the receipt, and that's what Fred had told them. Fred was not happy. Hello, thank you for calling Expo for Art. This is Fred. You're not Fred, I'm Fred. Are you trying to put me out of business? Why, Fred? Whatever do you mean? Someone has been giving prices to my customers and telling them their orders are in when they're not due for weeks. Well, Fred, who called them? Nobody called them. They called us. Then that's your problem. If someone called you and got pricing information, that would seem to be your problem. They didn't call me. They called you. Well, how would that happen? Your number is on my receipts and business cards. My, my. It seems to me that there's a very simple solution here. Take my number off of your receipts and business cards. Do you have any idea how much promotional material costs? Is it more than it costs to do these jobs for the prices you're quoting? Is it more than it costs to lose customers? Or less than that? This is extortion. Call it what you want, Fred. The choices and consequences are entirely up to you. A week later. 
Hello, Expo for Art. This is Fred. I've ordered new receipt books and cards. Can you please stop doing this? Sure. Bye, Fred. What would you do if you were in this situation? Would you get your own form of revenge or not? Please let us know. Oh, I'd get revenge all right. $10 and a pencil. A few years ago, after changing jobs, I found myself in a new office with a new phone number. After some orientation, training, and other new hire stuff, I finally get to sit down and do the things. I get my voicemail and answering machine set up, set up the email, and the phone rings. Good morning, railroad engineering. Yeah, when can I take the GED test? Sorry, wrong number. Click. Rings again. Seriously, when can I take the GED test? Like I said, wrong number. Bye. This went on for weeks, 15 to 20 calls a day. Some people screaming at me for not being the adult learning center. One day, an epiphany. This isn't the adult learning center? Nope. Do you know the number? Check Google. I did. This is the number on their website. Oh, really? A little Google foo of my own and I dig up a few numbers and give them a call. They tell me that they don't maintain their website and there's nothing they can do about it and it's not their problem. I'm just going to have to deal with it. My favorite line of that conversation was, What are you going to do about it? I work for the state. You can't do anything. Bye bye. And you can imagine that bye bye just dripped with the condensation that only a hubris and decades of Karenhood can muster. Oh no, let's dance. The next day. Good morning, this is Railroad. When can I take the GED test? We give that on request. It takes about an hour and a half. Come on down. Oh, awesome. How much is it? $10. Bring a pencil. We'll sharpen yours, but we can't supply them. Budget cuts, you know? Nah, I get it. See you in a bit. Take your time. They don't like me telling you this, but if you get here before we close, they have to give you the test. See you when you get here. Thanks, man. See you later. Now, for those of you who don't know, the GED test takes a whole day. It also usually costs upward of $100, depending on the state. In the state I was living and working at at the time, it was around $200. As such, it was only offered at certain intervals. So, as I was telling dozens of people per day that it was $10, took 90 minutes, and offered on request, I'm sure that they were absolutely inundated with angry people with freshly sharpened number two pencils, waving their $10 bills, and demanding the test that the guy on the phone told them they could come and take. Every morning I checked the website to see if my phone number was still on there. I also took the liberty of crawling around and getting the phone numbers for some managers. I was happy to hand these out when people called back to complain that they hadn't been allowed to take the test. Head back down there and ask to speak to random director and tell them that they called the number on the website and this is what they were told. It took them about six more weeks to change the website. For some reason, all of the manager's numbers disappeared from the website as well. Entitled lady always gets rotten salads. This story belongs to my beautiful wife who is a deli manager in a major regional grocery store in our area. She runs a tight ship and likes to keep things clean and up to date. So imagine her surprise when a customer, let's call her the entitled lady, reports that eight out of eight boxed salads, think macaroni salad, potato salad, that sort of thing, she had just bought were all bad. Entitled lady, I just bought these eight salads and every single one of them was spoiled and inedible. Beautiful wife, I'm sorry to hear that. It surprises me. Do you have them with you? I'll be happy to exchange them. No, I threw them away, but I have the receipt. Wife looks over the receipt. It is recent, like a day or two old and all in order. Against her better judgment, she errs on the side of good customer service and replaces the eight salads just on the basis of the receipt. That was Monday. Come Wednesday, beautiful wife is working on the fryer when she hears a familiar voice telling one of the team, I just bought these eight salads and every single one of them was spoiled and inedible. Beautiful wife steps forward and says, I've got this and the entitled lady does not look pleased to see my wife again. So, still all bad? Did you bring the salads back with you to exchange? No, they're too disgusting. I threw them all away, but I have the receipt. Wife, the trouble with that is that I can't send your receipt back to my vendor for credit on the bad salads. I need the salads to do the exchange. You didn't need them last time. Actually, I did, but I took you at face value and ate it that time. 
This is not something I'm inclined to do again. Karen, starting to rise like a cobra ready to strike. How dare you address me like that? Don't you know how good a customer I am to this store? I want to talk to the manager. Well, sweetie, that would be me. No spoiled salad to exchange, no exchange. At that, Entitled Lady storms off in a huff. Beautiful Wife checks with the rest of the team. It becomes clear that at least twice in the last week, the Entitled Lady had hit the deli during their busiest times and gotten new salads without having brought back the purportedly bad ones. That's at least 24 free salads over the last couple weeks. Right about then, Busy Store Director comes storming over with the Entitled Lady in tow. What's this I hear about you insulting our customers, beautiful wife? Wife. What did she tell you, Busy Store Director? How I refuse to exchange a product that she doesn't have? Or that over the last two weeks, she is the only person to complain about any of our salads being bad, and oddly enough, every single one she got from here was bad. Or that we already gave her dozens of free salads, and that is more than enough generosity for one deli. I'm not saying she's scamming us, sir, but if she doesn't bring the spoiled salad back with her to exchange, there will be no more exchanges. Busy store director. I see. As you were. Then to the entitled lady. You're lucky I don't ban you from the store for this behavior. The entitled lady realizes she won't get any further today and sulks away. Beautiful wife makes sure to train everyone on her team to require the old product be returned for any exchanges. A couple of days later, she's coming out of the cooler when she hears a familiar voice. I bought these eight salads the other day, and every single one of them was bad. It's a different worker who wasn't there last time. Different worker. Did you bring them back with you to exchange? No, they were gross. I threw them all away. I can't exchange them unless you bring them back. Beautiful wife smiles. Not even just this once? It's an honest mistake. Beautiful wife steps out into full view. Not even just this tenth time. Now get out of my deli and don't ever come back. The entitled lady fled and was never seen in those parts again. Never have I ever had an issue with a neighbor until this guy. I, 40 male, have never had an issue with a neighbor. I've been lucky up until now. I moved into a new home at the end of February 2020. I introduced myself and my family to the new neighbors. Like usual, some were more receptive and friendly than others. Within 30 days of buying the home and moving in, one of my next door neighbors started construction on a large concrete block building that is really close to the property line as well as really close to his back porch and another building in his backyard. I went to speak with him. He indeed told me that it was not permitted and agreed that it was probably too close to the property line. He said he had stopped construction on it but didn't know why I had such a big deal with it as it's just a shed. As soon as I mentioned construction and fire codes, he walks off and stated again he had stopped construction on it. Two days later, he continues construction. I tried to talk to him again and he just says, whatever buddy, and walks off. So I checked with the city and the zoning in our area requires a 12 foot setback for any structure, more depending on the height. This was less than four feet from the common wall between our yards. That wall is the property line. So I call the city. While describing my complaint, the operator pulls up recent aerial photographs of his property. She says that he has no permits on file with the city for any of the three other buildings in his backyard, the porch added to his home, the wall around his property, the structure he built in his front yard, etc. She also says that he has very obviously overbuilt his property and there are guidelines to what percentage of his property he can fill with buildings. The guy has a lot of unpermitted, uninspected buildings and construction on his property. The city went out and gave him a notice of violation for work without permits. He has been asked by the city multiple times for information on his property and has not replied. That was April 2020 when he got the notice of violation. He has a couple of dogs. When I first met him, he told me to come meet his dogs so that they won't bark at me too much. I did and it didn't seem like the dogs were barking that much. After he got the violation notice from the city, he would just leave his dogs outside for hours on end and let them bark and bark the whole time. It's just about mind numbing. The way his yard is set up, he has a driveway on one side that goes from the street out front to his backyard. The other side of his house borders mine and that is where the dogs are most of the time. It seriously sounds like they're right outside. With a TV and home theater on, AC running 
kids making noise, and all of the other household noises, I can still hear his dogs barking. 5 a.m. to 11 p.m., those dogs will bark. Lately, he started keeping one dog at a time on his back porch, but is confining them to some kind of kennel. It's only about 4 by 6 feet. The dogs will whine, yip, and bark for hours on end, and it's right on the other side of the wall for me. I feel bad for the poor dog, being confined for hours at a time. Summer temperatures are now getting over 100 degrees and can even get up to 115 during the summer. So, I go over to talk to him about his dogs and their barking. This was December 2020. He has a large block wall surrounding his front yard. It's about 7 or 8 feet tall. There's no way to access his front yard or his yard without going through a gate, which has barking slash snarling dogs on the other side. No doorbell, intercom, nothing. So I knock on the side of his house that's facing the street. I'm standing in his driveway. Both him and his wife come out. I asked him if he could do something about his dogs and their constant barking. He said to me, with a smirk on his face, that he doesn't know what I'm talking about and that his dogs never bark. This whole time, his dogs are barking so much that we can barely hear each other. You know what, buddy? You already cost me way too much money. Get off my property, he then says to me. I take two steps and I'm now on a city-owned sidewalk and near the street. His wife climbs on something from his front yard and is screaming at me from inside the yard, leaning over their wall. He comes out of his gate and takes his shirt off, trying to get me to fight him in the street. I just walked home. I didn't laugh, argue, yell, talk, or anything. At that point, I just walked home to avoid the confrontation that they were wanting. His dogs have continued to bark almost all day, every day since that interaction. I was contacted by a city inspector recently about the complaint. The inspector told me that they've been asking him for information for over a year and he has yet to comply so his notice of violation has officially been turned into a citation and he will have to go before a judge. The problem that the inspector has had is that he has been unable to make contact with my neighbor as he cannot get to the front door. He said that he has to issue the citation in person and also has to take pictures of the property when he serves the individual. The city inspector said that he is most likely going to have to get a police officer to escort him onto the property. I've been debating calling the city about the animal noise. If I do, I'll probably bring up the issue of the confined dog on the back porch. They handle animal noise separately than normal noise and disturbing the peace calls. He'll get fined between $50 and $500 per occurrence as I'll be required to complete a log of when I hear the dogs. He has clearly shown that he is unable to have a conversation about it and resolve it between the two of us. I know he's in trouble with the city already, but does he seriously think he can just continue to be a jerk without any repercussions? Like I've said, I'm 40. I've had plenty of neighbors through the years and have never had any issue with any of them until this guy. He's in big trouble already, but I feel like it might be too much under the circumstances, but I'd also like to be able to get a full night's sleep without having to listen to the dogs. Would I be the jerk if I filed an animal noise complaint with the city against my neighbor? Well, what would you do in the situation? Would you file a noise complaint or not? Please let us know. I'd be training like Rocky, then go over there and make him humble. Don't walk on my rocks. This story takes place one morning more than halfway through my army basic training at Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. 50 plus years later, some of the details are fuzzy or lost, but none of that really matters to the retelling of this tale. At the time of this malicious compliance, I had taken something to the company office for a drill sergeant and was returning to the training area. There wasn't any grass in our company area, it was just too dry for grass. Instead, we had rocks about the size of quarters and half dollars where you would normally expect grass. And the DIs had a rule, keep off my rocks. But this particular day, I didn't. I could have stayed on the concrete sidewalks, but I cut across the rocks, a distance of perhaps 30 feet rather than the 120 feet or so on the sidewalk and it almost worked out fine. Almost. About 10 feet before I was back on concrete, out rang, Hold it right there, trainee. It was my company's first sergeant. After a brief discussion of my error, he told me to Never walk on my rocks. Now drop and give me 20. Push-ups. So I did, and he walked into the building as I counted each one. I had become pretty familiar with this process over the past weeks. Let's just say I had plenty of practice. When you finished the assigned push-ups, you didn't just pop back to your feet. You called out, Permission to rise, Drill Sergeant, and waited for said permission. 
I thought about just getting up and going about my business. I knew he expected me to do just that because he went inside. But at this moment, I realized it might be interesting to wait for a while in the front leaning rest position, push-up position, right out in front of the company office. This began my malicious compliance. Perhaps a couple of minutes later, an officer, I think our company commander, came walking down the sidewalk from the parking lot. He paused and asked me what I was doing, so I told him. He said something like, okay, or I see, and continued inside the building. About 20 seconds later, the window nearest me shot open and First Sergeant stuck his head out saying, you can get up, son, you can get up. From the way he called out, I'm pretty sure he had been a bit embarrassed. The palms of my hands were a little sore for a couple of days, but it was well worth it. To Karen's husband, whose name isn't Chad, thank you so much for stopping the rant we both know she was building up to. You are a true hero. Now on with the story. This happened a few moments ago. I'm in the kitchen filling up the cleanser so I can spray my lobby down. I walk out carrying two spray jugs since no one else mixes any when they use it up. There's Karen and her husband, not Chad, standing in the lobby looking around wondering where the night audit is. Me. Good morning. How are you today? Karen gives me a blank stare. Not Chad. Good morning to you. Karen. I want to check out. Me. We can make that happen for you. What's your room number? Karen. This is my room number. Me. Give me a moment and I'll get you some paper airplane material. Are you guest names here? And did you sleep well? Karen, debating on if she should let me have it, decides for the moment I'm not worth it. I slept just fine till you checked someone in in the room next door. Me. Well, I do apologize that you were disturbed, but I only checked one guest in. That was at midnight and they were on the opposite side of the hotel. Karen. Whatever. Give me my receipt. I hand over the receipt and she stares at it for 10 minutes then starts to walk out the door, stops and turns around. This isn't me. I said this room number. Room right next door. Me. Oh, I do apologize. It's for the room she originally told me, but I'll take this on the chin. Karen. Why did they pay less? Me. You both paid through hooking, so I don't have an answer for you on that. Hooking is a separate third-party organization that sets its own prices, and we do not change them at all. Not Chad breaks in as Karen's face starts to turn an ugly shade of red. I don't care. Get in the car, Karen. It's not worth arguing over $2. Karen at this point is visibly debating on if she should let us both have it, but Not Chad has left the building, so she rushes out to get in the car. Thanks, Not Chad, and thanks for taking one for the hotel front desk team. We appreciate your efforts. Entitled Mom is trying to force me to change my last name. My mom got married recently and she and her husband have decided to hyphenate their names and form one family name. Her husband's kids and my half-siblings are all on board with changing their names to the hyphenated version. I am not on board with this for me. I've expressed this at least 20 times since it first came up. I don't want my name changed and I will not stand up in court and consent. My mom is so upset. She has tried talking me around, tried offering me bribes to go along with it. Her husband has asked me why I'm against it and I have told him straight, I like my name as it is and it's my tie to my dad, who passed two years ago, and I don't want anyone taking or adding anything onto it. My name has been my name for 15 years, and no, just because I'm a girl doesn't mean I'll change it when I get married, so that's not an argument to use with me. I also pointed out I could do the same when I'm older and get married and hyphenate, and I don't want three last names and his name would be the one to go in that circumstance, not my dad's. Both are pretty upset I won't work with them on this and agree to compromise a change. My mom has told me I'm being stubborn for the sake of being stubborn and having a family name that brings us all together is nice and I'm separating myself from that. Her husband told me I'm making him feel like there's something wrong with him slash his name. I told him that was a him problem and I had made my feelings clear. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her mom? Please let us know. Definitely the mom. This is how to make your kids not want to have anything to do with you 101. Idiot doesn't know how to use DoorDash. Let's be real. DoorDash is a plague unto this world. Ridiculous service fees, abysmal customer service, bad practices, few protections for the workforce, and the gig economy in general is a parasite on the industry. Now that the end of lockdown is on the horizon, its necessity has diminishing demand and should be excised for all but the few desperate establishments. Come out and eat, everyone. We're almost there. 
end rant onto the story. It's Memorial Day weekend, graduations are in full swing, and there's optimism in the air. We are slam Bama jamming, and there's a healthy wait list. Phone is non-stop ringing, and the annoying DoorDash bell tone won't stop blinging. We're still running with the skeleton crew, and the bottleneck of a small kitchen means we're already hitting one hour plus wait times on our to-go orders right from the outset. The volume won't stop, so eventually we have to put a pause on DoorDash orders once we hit the 90 plus minute mark. One of the last orders that snuck in before we shut it down was for a modest number of dishes that the customer had opted to pick up instead of using delivery. Hey, saves us like 20% off exorbitant fees. We've got our hustle in full swing and this guy shows up to the window soon thereafter and says he's here to pick up an order for, hmm, let's say Karen. We're a little confused since none of the ready bags have that name and no upcoming orders are listed under Karen. One of the hosts pulls up the DoorDash tablet and points at the 20th order down on the list. Was it this order? As she gives off the items. Yes, he says excitedly. Uh, I guess you showed up quite a bit early. It's still got more than an hour till it's ready. What? The app said it would be ready in 30 minutes. Not sure how that happened. We set the timer on that one for an hour and a half. Oh no, my wife is going to be very upset. All right, well, it's still going to be about an hour. Sorry about that. He leaves in a huff. Back in the flow until someone shows up at our window again. She's got her arms crossed and hungry for a confrontation. Hello, I'm Karen. My husband just told me that our order is going to take over an hour. I remain stoic. Yup, it's behind about 20 other tickets. The app said it would be ready in 30 minutes. I'm not sure how that happened. When we confirmed the order, we set the wait time to an hour and a half. I pull up the tablet to show her that there's still 62 minutes left. Well, that's BS. I'm already here. So isn't there anything you can do to speed up the process? Unfortunately, no. There's already several tickets ahead of you and we've got a full house of dine-in service. It's going to be about an hour. She continues stewing. Okay, I want to cancel my order. That's fine, I understand. I can pull your ticket off the line but you're going to have to get in your DoorDash app to cancel it so that you don't get charged. She stares down at her phone and angrily paces back to her car. My coworkers and I are looking at each other like, what the heck? Not even a few minutes later, she's back at the window looking more livid. She holds her phone out and starts jabbing her finger against the DoorDash app. I can't log in. She starts handing it over to me like she wants me to do it. I step back. I can't do that for you. All I can do on my end is pull the ticket off the line. She tries one more desperate plea. I spent $70 here. Are you saying my money's no good? You can't make it faster? $70 is a weird flex when there's a few orders ahead of hers in the $200 to $300 range. I couldn't help but chuckle, which honestly is not the best customer service response. She points at me sternly and says, You're a jerk, and wallows off. Guilty as charged. But also, her problem, not mine. The entire staff and I are laughing about this because it's just so absurd. I give the owner a heads up and he laments. It feels like DoorDash brings us nothing but headaches. Don't you know it, brother? Five minutes later, we get a phone call. It's Karen and she's a lot more conciliatory. Hi, I'm calling about earlier. If we still want our food, how long is it going to take? I'm easygoing. I don't take crap, but I'm also in the business of trying to make people happy so I don't take anything personal. The app now says 56 minutes. Let's see, we're still looking at roughly about an hour. What? I also hear her husband fully guffawing on speakerphone in their car. We were just there 15 minutes ago when you told us an hour. Is this some game where you just keep telling us an hour until you eventually close and never make our order? We want our cash back. I was fully on board with trying to help them out, but now I give no hoots. They ask to speak with a manager. I skip the line and ask the owner if he wants to share a piece of his mind. He gladly accepts. He's a super chill, easygoing guy and after being on the phone for 15 minutes with them, I see new veins in his forehead. How'd it go? I ask. I was explaining things to them and she told me to shut up and listen. No one talks to me like that. He gathers himself. Okay, forget DoorDash. We're deactivating the account. And like that, our prayers were answered. DoorDash may account for 20% of our business, but 90% of our headaches. Good riddance. Have you ever used DoorDash? And if so, did you like it? 
please let us know. I prefer to go get my food myself. Neighbor thinks I'm the cleaner. So this happened Saturday morning. I live in a nice brand new apartment. It's great and the few neighbors I've met have been pretty chill, with a few exceptions. Earlier in the week, some new neighbors moved into one of the apartments. Their movers left the front door open and while they were moving furniture in, a whole bunch of dead leaves from outside blew into the hallway. It was a huge mess. My apartment is literally the first door once you enter the building and every time I've come home since then, I've been walking on dead leaves. We do have the cleaners who come in about once or twice a week to clean the common areas, but Saturday morning as I was cleaning my apartment, I decided to pop outside and sweep up some of the leaves. I decided to leave most of them for the cleaners and only focus on the ones that were between the entrance and my door and a few leaves around there. Figured it's not my job to clean the whole place and I'd just take care of the leaves that were bothering me. Well, one of my neighbors saw me sweeping up in my PJs with bedhead and decided I was one of the cleaners. She saw that I was tying up my garbage bag and folding up my broom and dustpan. They sort of fold together for compact storage. Crazy lady. Hey, you're not done. Why are you getting ready to leave? Me. Oh, hi. Um, I am done. I was only sweeping the space between the hallway and my apartment. Well, that's just lazy. Do your job and sweep the rest of the hallway. It's been filthy for days. Me. Yeah, I know it's been filthy. That's why I decided to clean the spot between the front door and my door. You live here? So why do you only clean once or twice a week? If you live here, you should be cleaning every day. Stop being so lazy. Me. Ma'am, I'm not a cleaner. I'm a resident. The mess in the hallway bothered me, so I cleaned the part that was annoying me. If the rest of it bothers you, then clean it yourself. Karen. How dare you? I'm going to call body corporate and have you fired and thrown out of this building. Me. Ma'am, I own this apartment and I own my own business. I do not work for our apartment's body core organization and I am not a cleaner. I live here. The mess bothered me, so I cleaned it. If the rest of the mess bothers you, then you clean it. I'm not your servant and not going to do it for you. Well then, why are you cleaning the hallway? You think I'm stupid? No one would clean the hallway unless they were getting paid. Or unless they don't want to trek dead leaves into their home every time they get back. Well, if you really are doing this on your own, you won't mind sweeping up the rest of the holes, so do it. Me. Yeah, no. Had you asked me politely, I might have considered it. But after this exchange, you can either do it yourself or wait for the cleaners to come do it. I'm going to go back inside and continue cleaning my place. Nice meeting you though. I walked in and she started banging on my door for a while, but I just threw some disturbed on my stereo and let David Draven drown out her knocks. Didn't end well though. I went out later to throw away my trash in the dumpster downstairs. This crazy jerk, I suspect, didn't actually see her, but who else would do it? Had swept all of the leaves in front of my door. So I grabbed my trusty broom and swept them all further down the hall to her door. Have a feeling we're going to be playing this game until the cleaners show up. Maybe I'll borrow my buddy's leaf blower and just rev it up outside her door. It is pretty loud. Am I the jerk for not allowing my father-in-law to have a say in my baby's name? Me, 30, male, and my father have the same initials. We have the same last name but different first and middle names. My wife's first name also starts with the same letter as mine. She took my name when we got married, so we have the same first and last initials. When we got pregnant with our oldest, seven, male, we followed the tradition of having the same initials as me as well as my dad. My son shares the same middle and last name, but has a different first name than myself and my father. We thought it was cute. When our second child was born, four, female, we wanted to continue the tradition, but she has the same initials as my wife instead of me. My wife, 29, is currently pregnant with our last kid. This pregnancy has taken a large toll on my wife, so we've made the decision for me to get snipped once baby comes. My wife is her father's only kid. We have an okay relationship. He tries to butt in a lot when it comes to our parenting, but we shut him down pretty well. Anyways, once we found out my wife was pregnant, we picked one girl name and one boy name. If it's a boy, he will have the same initials as me and his brother. If it's a girl, she will have the same initials as her mother and sister. We have just learned it's a boy and have his name picked out. We shared our news a week ago. My wife was on a video call with her dad updating him on everything and shared baby's name. He said that because this will be our last kid and his final grandkid, 
He thinks he should get a say in the name. My wife asked what he meant and he said he would want the baby to be named after him or share a middle name. He even suggested doing something that honors his military career, like naming him after my father-in-law's favorite general. My wife said that while she understands his desire, we have already selected our son's name. We thought that was the end of it. We recently ran into a buddy of his and he expressed how upset father-in-law was over not being included in our son's name. How our tradition was tacky and how we can allow my father-in-law a say in one of the grandkids' names or we should just have another one after this baby if we like our current name so much. We kind of just walked away but my wife is furious and honestly so am I. I care for my father-in-law but these are our kids. My wife is struggling enough with her current pregnancy. I called him and expressed it was kind of low of him to go around spreading our business or suggesting my wife keep popping kids out. If he wanted to name a kid so bad, he should go have another. He hung up and hasn't spoken to us since. So am I the jerk? Edit. I want to thank everyone for the nice words. I appreciate all the concern for my wife and our new baby. I can see that I'm not the jerk for wanting to keep our tradition going, but I can see how my father-in-law may feel left out and how I should have definitely gone off on his friend instead of him. So I'll be phoning him in a few days and see how we can fix this. He's a great guy, father, and grandfather, so I want him to feel welcomed in our family. Edit 2. I'm getting this a lot, but some people seem to think there's some big long generational thing my side of the family did as far as initials. It's literally just my dad and I who have the same initials. We did this for our oldest because when he was born, my dad was passing. My wife requested we do this since he would not be around to see our son grow up. We continued it with our daughter because it would be weird for her to have a completely different name versus myself, my wife, and her brother. Which is why we are doing this for our final kid. My dad has since passed. We are both no contact with our mothers, so my father-in-law is my kid's only grandparent. He certainly isn't being left out of their lives or anything. We aren't doing this as some grand forget you like many of you are suggesting. Final edit. Guys, please stop suggesting father-in-law get a dog or something. He's already got two, Reginald and Turnip. He's already got a boat and a motorcycle too, so he doesn't need anything else to be named. And please stop suggesting he have another baby. My wife will be 30 in a couple of months, and I really don't think she wants to help raise our kid and her brother at the same time. Blockbuster scheduled me for 120 plus hours in the two weeks after I quit. This happened decades ago and I'm not afraid to say it happened in a blockbuster. I had a terribly uptight, power-hungry manager who refused to listen and hated me for standing up to her. She wrote me up because she didn't recognize you could reverse an order in the system. She wrote me up for a mistake another manager made, and she wrote me up for not coming to a 9 a.m. meeting after closing until 2 a.m. the night before. Anyway, the actual story. In the final year of high school, I put in my two weeks notice that my last day of work would be December 15th. I didn't want to handle the Christmas rush. I wanted to see my friends New Year's Eve and also it was a terrible job. On December 15th, I go to drop off my uniform shirt and pick up my last paycheck. On my way out of the office area, I notice the schedule. My name is scheduled to work 8 to 10 hours a day for most of Christmas break. The whole week preceding Christmas, Christmas Eve until 2 a.m., Christmas Day, the intervening week, New Year's Eve until 2 a.m., and New Year's Day. The following conversation ensued. Me. Hey, manager, you know I'm not working here anymore, right? Manager. If your name is on the schedule, you have to work. You know that. Me. I don't work here anymore. Your name wasn't in the holiday time off folder, so you got put on the schedule. Next time, request off earlier. Me. I don't work here anymore. If you're going to walk out on your shift, you're required to find someone to cover for you. At this point, a customer is eavesdropping while pretending to browse the recently returned but not yet shelved card of movies. I address him. Me. Excuse me, sir. Are you available to cover my shift on Christmas Eve? Manager. He doesn't work here. Me. Neither do I. I wish I could say I threw my uniform shirt at her and everyone clapped, but she followed me to my car, yelling at me. She then called my parents on Christmas Eve and told my mother she failed to raise a worthwhile kid and I had to file formal complaints. Bonus points. After that, she was put on leave and the assistant manager had to cover New Year's Eve. Unfortunately, with all the drama about the general manager being too stupid to know that I had already quit, there was nobody else scheduled to work on New Year's Eve.
entitled Mom at a Campground, expects me to have a shirt for her kid to tie-dye, throws world-class tantrum when I don't. So my boyfriend and I went camping this weekend at a campground, and we met this couple and their son, who was around seven, while we were setting up our tent, and they were setting up at the plot next to ours. We had some polite small talk, and we mentioned that we bought a tie-dye kit to tie-dye a couple of t-shirts while we were there. It was really just a small, cheap tie-dye kit, and we both brought two shirts to make. The mother immediately got excited and said her son would love to do tie-dye with us later that night. We were caught off guard, but I was sure there'd be some extra dye, and I didn't really care that much, so I said sure. A few hours of hiking and fishing go by, and then we're ready to go back and settle into our campsite, eat dinner, and start making our t-shirts. We round the corner towards camp, and it was as if this kid was waiting for us. He was right at the path and then sprinted back to his campsite. Once we got closer, his mother stomped over to the trail, and this is how this conversation went. Entitled Mom Where have you guys been? We've waited hours. Me Uh, we've been hiking. But he can come use it in a little bit once we set it up. I was totally caught off guard that she even approached me that way, but I blew it off again. Like, did this lady expect me to alter my plans all day to cater to her kid? We get to our campsite, and I'm about to start dinner, but this lady and her kid are just staring at us. So, I decide to just get the dye ready so he can bring his stupid t-shirt over and leave us alone so we can eat in peace. I bring the tie-dye out, and they come over to our table. Empty-handed. Entitled Mom. Looks great. He's a small or a medium. Me. What? I don't have anything for him to use. I thought you had your own t-shirt that you wanted to tie-dye. Entitled Mom. No! You are the ones who brought the tie-dye kit. We waited all day for you to get back. And now you're saying that you don't even have a t-shirt for him? Me. I don't know what to tell you. We only have four t-shirts to make for ourselves. I can't believe you told my son that he could tie-dye and got his hopes up. He waited for you all day. Can he have one of yours? Me. Absolutely not. I said while laughing. It's not funny. Don't laugh at me. At that point, I'm just like, whatever lady and we keep snickering at her until they storm back to their campsite, where she starts playing metal music full blast. It's hilarious. She was insane, throwing a full-blown tantrum and glaring at us from afar. An hour or so later, the ranger comes over to our tent and said he got a report that we were drinking. We were drinking, but they typically don't care unless we're disturbing other campers, and we were just two people sitting and eating dinner quietly. I told them what happened, and he thought it was hilarious and I jokingly said that I'd like to make a counter-report about Entitled Mom's music. He was like, heck yeah, I'll do that, and went over to her. She threw a fit when he told her to turn that crap down, and I heard her screaming about how we're partying and drinking, and how dare he confront her and not us. Eventually, her husband turned her music off while she was mid-screech, then she sulked into her tent and never came back out, and the ranger came back over to our site for a beer after dark. We considered calling her poor husband over for a beer too, but decided not to poke the bear. You can absolutely wait to speak to the owner. Just found this sub and wanted to share my story from more than 20 years ago. I was attending grad school at the time to finish my doctoral degree, which I'm only mentioning as it's relevant because the customer made a crack about intelligence while working at my father's business, an auto salvage yard. Our yard was located in New Jersey and this event occurred in August, so it was hot and very humid. I was generally very dirty when I was at work with grease and grime all over my arms and clothes. If you washed your hands and arms every time they looked dirty, your skin would just get dry and irritated. So with the exception of stopping to eat, I was absolutely filthy all day long. Our yard mostly dealt with shops and small independent mechanics who came in looking just as dirty as I was, so it was completely normal. Another point relative to this story is this. I look absolutely nothing like my father. He is 5 foot 8 and weighs at most 140 pounds, and I'm 6 foot 2. And back then, I was powerlifting and weighed right around 220 pounds. So here's my story. A guy comes in to pick up something he bought when I was not there that had to be taken out of a car. I don't even remember what it was now, but it was something fairly heavy for him, not for me, and dirty. If we had parts in our warehouse, they'd get scrubbed and cleaned by me before being labeled and cataloged but parts coming right off a car just had the loose grime knocked off. So, the guy comes in looking very out of place for our yard, wearing a button-down shirt, khakis, and dress shoes. He hands me his receipt, and I tell him I'll bring it out the side door. I walk out with his item on a hand truck, and the only vehicle I see parked is an Acura sedan. 
very unlike the beat-up shop vehicles most of our customers drove. The guy is walking around the front of his car talking on his phone, but the trunk is open, so I bring the hand truck around and leave his item on the ground with a piece of cardboard to keep his trunk clean and go back inside. A few minutes later, he comes inside wanting to know what he is supposed to do with the part, to which I facetiously reply, install it, I imagine. He wants to know why the part is dirty. I replied, it's used. He wants to know how he is supposed to get it home. I reply, in your car. He wants to know why I didn't put the item in his truck and I point to the sign behind him, which admittedly is partially obscured by the open door, which says that we are not responsible for loading parts due to liability for possible damage to the customer's vehicle. He turns around, looking upset, and shouts, What am I supposed to do now, genius? Because I must be dumb if I'm dirty, right? There are now two other customers by the office, and I know them both well, so I tell them I'll be right with them and walk around outside to the guy's car because I just want him gone. I throw a blanket over the rear bumper of his car, remind him that I'm not liable for damage, and I lift the piece up and gently put it on the cardboard in his car. To do this without damaging anything, I had to put one of my hands on the side of the trunk and I left a huge greasy handprint, largely on purpose. While I'm loading, he is standing so close to me, supervising, that my arm bumps his arm and his sleeve gets dirty. The entire time this exchange has been going on, he's been on his phone and he's now ranting into his phone about our interaction and he calls me genius again and I reply, you came to a salvage yard to pick up a heavy, dirty, used part and dress clothes with a luxury car. Who's the genius? At that point, he also noticed the grease on his car and his dirty sleeve and he wants to know if the owner is here and I tell him Bob is working out in the yard. He demands to speak to him and I say fine. We walk back around to the office and I point to Bob who is way out in the yard on his forklift moving cars that are going to the crusher. This is time sensitive because the truck will come to pick them up and block the entire street while we load so we have to be ready. He starts to walk into the yard and I try to stop him and tell him it's too dangerous. He keeps walking, so I point out that our Doberman is trotting along behind the forklift. She was actually our dog from home and very friendly, but we brought her with us every day because we couldn't get home to let her out. He sees the dog and stops, and I tell the guy he has to wait until Bob is finished moving vehicles and it will be a while, which he says is fine because he's going to tell Bob exactly how his customers are being treated. Over the next 40 minutes, I walk past the guy multiple times helping customers and each time I pass him, he mutters something about being fired and me being sorry. Finally, the forklift shuts down and Bob stands up and my new friend seems ecstatic, banging on the counter and telling me that Bob is done and he wants to speak to him immediately. I walk outside with my new friend right next to me, climb up on a car's fender and wave my arms to get Bob's attention and scream, Hey dad, this guy wants to talk to you. And with that, my new buddy says, forget you, turns and walks out, hops in his car and guns it up the street. Fired? Are you sure? Okay. Note 1. This story was told to me by a friend and it's about her father. It takes place around 2005. Note 2. This happened in Sweden, where there's no at-will employment. Once an employee is past the initial six-month probation period, you can't fire them without a cause, which also requires an established paper trail. So, my friend's father, who has since retired, was a mechanical engineer. He was around 55 when this happened and very experienced in his field. In fact, he had some skill sets that were so unique to the extent that you might be able to replicate them, but at extreme costs. We're talking multiple people from multiple companies from multiple countries taking weeks if not months to get up to speed with specific projects to do the same things. He was a no BS kind of guy who did his job, did it well but also pointed out problems and expected others to point out problems to him. He was extremely solution-oriented and had no time for office politics or keeping a positive attitude at work. Basically, your everyday grumpy old engineer who really knew his thing and was always ready to help if you asked, but not very forthcoming in team building exercises and so on. He also ran his own business on the side, doing minor projects and so on. As was required by his employer, he had reported this and was sure to not cause any conflicts of interest, so his employer knew and accepted this. He was considered a valuable employee and got several awards that he cared little for. But anyway, during his many years with this employer, by all accounts, they paid him well, respected his knowledge and accommodated his style and he returned the favor by working very hard and making sure to mentor younger and newly employed engineers to make them effective co-workers. 
Then his firm was acquired by a larger firm and a new management team installed. Initially, everyone was promised that things would remain the same, but with the new management came a new office culture. The new management pressured for unpaid overtime, for a more American corporate culture with cheering and clapping and so on. He considered it extremely cringe and refused to participate. His status as a long-standing and knowledgeable employee kept him safe for some time before the new management realized that resistance to the new culture centered around him and started pressuring him to play along. When he did not, they turned increasingly hostile, realizing that he held a lot of soft power in the company, having mentored a large percentage of the engineers and resistance to their leadership centering around him. They started ordering him to work overtime. He answered that he was on time with his projects and that if they had identified an emergency requiring overtime, they would have to bring it up with the union to negotiate the overtime and make sure it was an actual emergency. The contract with the union said no overtime unless in an emergency. They tried to force him to participate in the cheering and clapping by making it mandatory for him to attend and yelling at him to participate. And he did, but so unenthusiastically that the event turned even more cringe and people started laughing. The workday turned more and more hostile and he knew that things would come to a head sooner or later. Being an experienced engineer and knowing how to document things, he already had his ducks in a row. Then it finally happened. They caught him answering an email for his side business on his work laptop, brought him in and fired him on the spot for theft of company resources. He sat at the conference table and looked the three managers in their eyes, one after the other, and asked, Are you sure you want to do this? They all said yes. Are you really sure you want to do this? He was escorted to his desk by security to leave his phone, his badge, and his computer at the desk, and then escorted out. Once out of the building, he phoned his union representative, who immediately canceled the firing, claiming there was no just cause, which meant that it would go to the labor board for arbitration. You see, the company had an IT policy that it was okay to use the company laptop for personal business, including a side business, as long as you were on a break and compliant with IT security protocols. And the company was aware of and had approved his side business, and he was on a break. Of course, he had his declaration of a side business signed by his former manager and the IT policy available and sent both to the union representative. Then he called his lawyer and asked him to send the pre-prepared cease and desist on two patents he had. Patents that were not that significant and nothing he could make any serious money out of since they were mostly for very specific things used by the solutions he designed and used at his employers. But still his that he had brought with him into the employment and allowed the employer to use in exchange for a slightly higher pay. All duly documented in his contract, of course. Then he went home for some vacation and tending his side business. He was always a man to prepare and had enough money saved up to last him a good time, to the extent that he considered retiring entirely. My friend said he had two job offers from competitors that had looked to snipe him for some time within the week, basically as soon as they learned he was available. He was gracious but declined but offered them to consult with his side business now that he had the time which they eagerly accepted, at twice the hourly rate that he made at his earlier employers. His colleagues started ringing the day after for advice, since the projects he had managed could not go on without him. He was perfectly polite but denied any information and help, saying he had left everything he had with management and to contact them, as he was no longer employed there. Several clients that phoned his private number were told the same thing. Since his private number was not on a public registry, he suspected that both colleagues and clients spent some time and or money to find it. It took two weeks before a manager phoned him and asked things. He politely declined to answer, got yelled at, and replied with something like, I'm sorry, you must have mistaken me for someone who works for you, and hung up. This happened a few times, and the next week HR phoned him and stated the firing had been a mistake and he was welcome back to his job. He again politely declined, saying that he awaited the labor board's decision, but until then he was happy to consult for them at six times his hourly pay, after taxes and administrative costs of course. After a few days of wrangling and trying to negotiate, they had to accept, and then he sprung the patent issues on them, forcing them to pay for those too. Less than two and a half weeks after being fired, he was back at his desk. After roughly three months, the firing came to the labor board. The employer stated that they believed they had handled the issue correctly but were still willing to offer my friend's father his position back in the interest of goodwill and a reconciliation. 
My friend's father and the union simply stated that he was now employed elsewhere, his own company, and no longer available. The labor board ruled in his and the union's favor and he got the normal damages, three months pay damage and 24 months pay severance package, including pension and of course the lawyer costs of the union paid by the employer. According to my friend, her father continued to work there until he retired, working 20 hours or so per week and 10 to 15 hours for other companies, making a pretty penny, continuing to charge them three times what he charged their competitors as a jerk tax. The managers were not fired, but they were moved into their own group apart from the rest of the department when it came to bonus calculations and the costs of her father's consultancy fees and the costs of the labor board arbitration were budgeted there meaning they were constantly over budget and thus ineligible for bonuses for several years, which was a decent percentage of the incentives at that company, making at least one of them quit. My friend also said her father usually met any management complaints with a big crap-eating grin and, what are you gonna do, fire me? After that, I'm suing my parents. Okay, it sounds bad, but hear me out. I, 18 female, was 16 at the start of this story, which is important. So because of my birthday and skipping a grade, I graduated high school at 16. At the time, I took a gap year and got a paid internship. With no bills other than a few purchases, I was able to save the majority of my pay, which is around $12,000. Once the year was up, I applied to multiple schools in and out of my state. My parents knew this. Well, I'm guessing they didn't think I'd get into the ones out of state because they were very upset once I started getting acceptance letters. Surprisingly, the ones out of state were giving me large scholarships that would cover either all or most of my schooling. Well, only one in-state gave me a full ride and truthfully it was my backup, so to me it was a no-brainer to pick an out-of-state school. My parents didn't want this, so they made a deal. Pick an in-state school to complete my associates in and they would cover whatever the scholarship didn't as well as getting me a cash car and a reasonable apartment. Well, I reached out to my school of choice and they said I could put off my admission if I did in fact reapply with my associates. So I went with my parents' plan. Well, they got the car and I had to live my first year in a dorm and get an apartment the second year. Now it's time for them to pay for my second year what the scholarship won't cover and my apartment and they're telling me that I'm an adult, 18, and need to be responsible for myself, i.e. refusing to get the apartment and pay for school. I told them that this was not our agreement and they told me it's not like I can't afford it, which is true. Working part-time and doing tutoring, I've put an additional $6,000 in my savings the past year. Well, at the time of the agreement, I got the agreement written and notarized, so I told them that I would get it legally enforced if they didn't come through. Obviously, they didn't take kindly to this, and I'd hate to sue my own parents, but I feel like I've worked so hard only for them to dry and back out now. Edit. Since the legality of the contract is a popular theme, I'll put this in. The contract is legally enforceable. They had to sign a separate document allowing me, a minor, to enter a contract. At the time, I told them I wouldn't take their offer if I didn't have a way to cover my butt. For those wondering how a kid was so savvy, I'm going to law school. Updates. So, I had another conversation with my parents. My mom was upset that I'm so serious about taking them to court. She said that I was selfish and spoiled and that they have sacrificed enough and it was time for them to live their lives. She ended up walking out and telling me she was ashamed to have such a daughter. As much as this hurt me, my dad was more receptive after my mom left and he apologized and asked if I'd be willing to compromise and stay in the dorm if they paid for my school. I told him this was fine under the condition the balance was paid by the end of June rather than the final day, August, because while I appreciate his apology, I can no longer trust them. I didn't tell him thus, but this would give me enough time to pay the balance myself, worst case scenario, and hire a lawyer should he not come through. I also had planned on taking a break this summer and not working, but seeing as I might have to potentially pay for school and a lawyer, I'll be getting a job and door dashing to put as much in my savings as possible. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you go ahead and sue your parents or not? Please let us know. Once you sign a legally binding contract, you don't have a choice. Sorry, mom and dad. Entitled Aunt nearly ruins free vacation. This story happened before lockdown. I love Ireland. My grandmother told me stories and inspired a pride and love for my heritage and taught me how to properly represent myself. I am not Irish, but my ancestors were. Years ago, I started studying Gaelic, the Irish language. 
I'm still very novice at speaking and understanding it, but I enjoy trying to learn and like hearing it spoken. I was starting to think about another trip when one of my cousins contacts me. We never had much contact because we grew up so far apart, but I liked him well enough. He had started learning Gaelic and was interested in having someone to practice with, so we did. We helped each other and learned together. It's difficult language and like I said, still very novice. Well, I was planning a trip to Ireland. I had been a few times, but this time I wanted to stay in the Galtact, the regions of Ireland where Gaelic is primarily spoken instead of English. The people there speak English, but as a second language. I thought my cousin would enjoy a trip as well. I spoke with my uncle and we made a deal. Since cousin was in his first year of college, I told him if he finished his freshman year with at least a 3.5 GPA, I would pay for him to go with me. He worked really hard and was taking mostly honors classes and came out with a 3.4. I of course let him feel a little grief from trying so hard only to come up short, then told him that he was still going with me. You could say I shouldn't have, but he genuinely worked very hard and I believe he earned it. Plus, he's a good kid and I want to encourage him to keep working hard in his education. Now for a little quick background. My cousin's parents, Aunt C and Uncle T are people of limited means, not speaking poorly of them. Uncle T works hard to give them a comfortable life. Aunt C is my dad's sister and the grandmother I mentioned earlier is her mom. Uncle T is the son of Italian immigrants. While trying to put Cousin B through school, they couldn't afford to send him on vacation, but I assured them the whole trip was on me. I actually was splurging a bit because I wanted it to be an awesome experience for Cousin B. I got business class seats for the flight and booked two rooms on a really nice bed and breakfast. I was excited. My cousin was so pumped he was shaking. Then Uncle T calls me. He asked if there was any chance I could include him and Aunt C on the trip. He understood it was a huge thing to ask and stressed that it was no pressure. I thought about it a bit and decided I would bring them along. My grandmother would have praised the generosity. I told him that since it was so close to the trip, I could only get them economy seats and he said that that was fine. I also managed to book another room at the B&B. I also expressed that the purpose of this trip was for Cousin B and I to interact with native Gaelic speakers, but there would be some time for sightseeing. We could also visit the town our ancestors came from in County Mayo. This is where I learned what a Karen my Aunt C is. It started at the airport. I had managed to upgrade their tickets to Economy Plus, which on an international flight is not too bad. But my aunt was saying that Cousin and I should sit there while the grown-ups get the nice seats. I was 30 at that time. My cousin was 19. My uncle looked embarrassed. She told Cousin B to give her his ticket and he almost did. I had to nip this in the bud. I paid for all of these seats, so I will determine who sits where. Those are still nice seats. Enjoy your flight. Aunt C. Oh, so since you paid for everything, you think you're in charge? Me. Yes, and if you don't like it, you can go home. She huffed but stayed silent. Uncle T gave me a wink and Cousin B apologized for his mom's behavior. At one point, he quietly said to himself, she always does this. Great. We arrive in Ireland and took a cab to our bed and breakfast. The first two days were great. Cousin B and I went out and tried to awkwardly converse with the locals who were as gracious as you could wish for and helped us a lot. We mostly did stuff separately from uncle and aunt, which was fine, but I noticed aunt was getting a little edgy. And on our fourth morning at breakfast, she snapped. One of the girls working at the B&B brought them their breakfast and apparently greeted them in Gaelic, like she did every morning. This was the point where everyone there began to hear, Does anyone in this place speak English? Oh God, it's like being in a foreign country. My grandmother lived her whole life here. She could speak English. Why can't you? Before I could appreciate that my aunt had actually said, it's like being in a foreign country, I was out the door and running across the yard. I apologized to the poor girl and gave her a 50 euro note, then went to talk to my aunt. Do you not understand what I told you about this part of Ireland? I thought I explained that Irish Gaelic is the primary language spoken here. Most people will start interactions in Irish and it is a big part of the B&B's business too. She just sat in her room looking huffy and Uncle T told me he'd handle it. He had fallen in love with Ireland and had been thoroughly enjoying the trip, so I let him deal with it. Then went to talk to the landlady to ensure we wouldn't be thrown out. 
she didn't tolerate mistreatment of her staff but said if it happened again, they would have to leave. That day, I had rented a car and would be driving out to where my ancestors originally lived near Castle Bar. I invited aunt and uncle, but aunt just stayed in the room. So the three of us went without her. It was an emotional thing visiting the little village, and I can't describe it, but cousin and I both felt like we could feel the spirits of our ancestors there. I know it's corny, but it was powerful. We found the graves of some of them as well. Uncle was mostly silent and respectfully let us experience it. Later, he told us about his parents leaving Italy. Rest of the trip was pretty quiet, but Aunt C never left the room or spoke to anyone there. Although she did charge a pretty expensive lunch to the room, my card, through a local high-class restaurant, Uncle T offered to pay me back for it, but I refused. We flew back, and the whole flight cousin was going on and on about how amazing it was. It was clear that he had found a new love for international travel. So I told him if he keeps his grades up, maybe we could go next summer. It became a regular trip for us, but never again brought the parents, except for his final year. I was not going to have the time off to go, but thought I would mix it up. For a graduation gift, I sent him and Uncle T to Italy to see where that part of his family was from. I intentionally left out Aunt C, and she was upset about it, but never got back to me. Though I heard she was deeply insulted. If anyone is wondering if I had other cousins, aunts, or uncles who were jealous, the answer is yes. My dad has six siblings, and all of them have kids in a wide spectrum of ages. When asked why I never brought any of them, I said it was because Cousin B was the only one to show any serious interest in our heritage and the language. While granted, most of our trips involved failing to converse with people, then saying, oh well, and heading to the pub, it was still a fun challenge for us. However, if any other cousins wanted to show a serious interest in the language, they would be welcome. None did. Have you ever visited another country? And if so, where did you go to? Please let us know. One of these days I'd really love to go to Carantopia. Don't lie to the residents. Was reminded of this little occurrence from a few years back today. Thought I'd share it. Don't know if it's malicious in the traditional sense, but I did follow instructions to the letter and embarrass the one giving instructions, so I don't know. Tell me what you think. So about three years ago, I worked for a care home. I still do work for a care home, but I also did three years ago. It's primarily nursing care with a little dementia care. The residents can range from being totally independent and capable of going about their day with minimal assistance from staff to end of life care with checks every half hour to make sure there's always someone with them. The particular resident I'm going to be talking about here we'll call Dot because she looked like the East Enders character of the same name, only with a thick Liverpoolian accent. Dot had a great sense of pride and a low tolerance for anyone she believed was talking down to her. She was largely independent, just had a few funny turns here and there. I was working a night shift when this happened, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and it was around midnight. My colleague was setting up breakfast trays for the morning, I believe, whilst the nurse was doing a few clerical duties. We had a nurse from an agency due to ours being ill. Agency workers can be a mixed bag here. Some are lovely, hardworking, and understanding. Some are grumpy and uptight. Some we politely ask if they don't get sent again. The nurse that night felt squarely into the middle category. She would be snippy with the care staff, opting to do her work without any communication to us unless it was absolutely necessary to hand anything over to us. Fair enough, nobody says you have to make friends here and would treat the residents with a false smile and a semi-condescending tone, sort of like you'd expect one to use when talking to kids. Dot was going through one of her funny turns. She had put her coat on and was trying to barge her way out of the front door. I came across the reception area to find the nurse trying to talk with Dot, with Dot trying to get to the front door saying, get out of the way, you miserable old trout, to the nurse. The nurse was saying things like, I'm sorry, Miss Dot, but we need to look after you here. It would be irresponsible of us to allow you to wander about outside at this time. You could seriously hurt yourself. Look, it's dark outside. All things that seemed to make Dot angrier and angrier. After a while, Dot stormed off. I asked the nurse why Dot wanted to get out of the home. Because she has dementia. Yes, but why in her own mind is she trying to leave? In her mind, it makes perfect sense for her to leave the home. What's her reasoning? Oh, she wants to go to the pharmacy. What difference does that make? We can't allow the residents out unsupervised for any reason, and especially not in the dead of night. I'll talk to her. No, you will not. I know how people like you work. 
You'll say anything to keep the residents happy, even if it means filling their heads with lies. Well, I was taught that we have to be honest with the residents. And this is true. You can't tell a resident an outright lie, at least not where I work. If a resident with dementia is distraught because their mother hasn't given them a phone call, you cannot say to them something like, Oh, but she did ring you about a couple of hours ago, remember? However, it's kind of frowned upon to say something like, She passed 20 years ago. She can't use the phone, honest as it may be. You have to learn to use tact, omit details if they could cause distress, and treat the residents with some modicum of dignity. Anyway, somehow I convinced the nurse to let me speak to Dot. The nurse said that if she sees me lie to Dot, she will file a report and sees that the home manager knows that I am institutionalizing the residents, which is a very, very serious accusation here. We made our way to Dot's room. She's angrily stuffing things into her handbag at the time. The nurse folded her arms and stood in the doorway as I spoke to Dot. Dot? What do you want, OP? What are you getting all dressed up for? Is something special happening? I need to go to the pharmacy. They have my medicine. But Dot, it's Sunday. The pharmacy isn't open on Sunday. Dot stopped in her tracks. For the first time, she looked confused rather than angry. Is it? Yes, Dot. Look, here's your clock. It says today's date on it, and it says Sunday. See? Dot made a sheepish face to this. Oh, oops. I suppose I'd better get settled. I do actually feel rather sleepy. I left Dot to it. When I walk out the door, the nurse is stunned that I had handled it so easily. She tried to sputter out that it was still filling the resident's head with lies for the sake of a quiet life. I just asked her, what day is it right now? And she didn't have an answer. The nurse tried to speak to my colleague about my behavior later that night. My colleague basically told her that what I did was the same thing she would have done. When Dot had her funny turns, she would argue with you about the time of day, how safe it was outside, etc. But as you got to know the residents, you got to know what kind of advice they'd be willing to listen to. Anyway, there's the time an angry resident calmed down and a grouchy nurse got egg on her face. I hope you enjoyed. Boss says I don't know anything yet, so I do the absolute bare minimum. Some background. I started my first full-time office job in corporate America a week after college. It was an industry I hadn't worked in before and I needed to be licensed. The company that hired me, we'll call them Smith Inc., paid for my licensing fees, study materials, classes, etc. for me to become licensed. The total cost was about $500. It was a sweet deal. They gave me approximately 90 days paid to study a textbook and pass an online course. I didn't have to do any work for the company, simply study and pass the licensing exam. It was pretty easy and I passed on my first try. My boss, let's call her Mary, was super excited that I passed and I began training under an associate level coworker who had just been promoted from the position I was in. The coworker, Jen, was super great and helpful. She began training me on two simple tasks that I could do. The only rule was if the client had a question specifically about their contract, I would ask Jen or forward it to my team lead. Well, I ended up getting an email from a client about their contract and I video called Jen to ask how to handle. She walked me through it as I shared my screen with her. I wrote the email back to the client exactly how she told me and she read the email before sending. A month goes by and everything is great. I'm learning and getting more comfortable. Then I get a really nasty email from Mary. She CCs my whole team into the email going on and on about how I cannot answer contract questions and how she's gone over this with me before. She hadn't. Jen was the one who told me I can't answer contract questions. Both Jen and I tried to explain what happened and that Jen was the one who wrote the email. I just typed what Jen said and sent it from my email since the client emailed me and not Jen. Mary then calls the team up in a video call and goes on about how I don't know anything and I just started and I really don't know how this industry works and that answering contract questions is out of my job description. It went on for about 5 minutes. I say okay and get off of the call crying. The next day, out of pure pettiness, I simply do the absolute bare minimum. I don't know anything, right Mary? I still complete all my tasks and everything that's required of me. Anything more advanced that I would normally try to learn with Jen's help? Nope. I just forwarded it to our team lead and said, Sorry, Mary said I can't do anything outside of my job description. Work was less stressful after I decided to listen to Mary and what many others told me before.
Don't do anything outside of your job description. Also, Mary later fired me for being a whistleblower when I reported the company to health authority for violating lockdown protocols. I sleep better at night knowing how much money Mary wasted on training me. Register 10 is open. I spent 10 years working in various locations of the two major US toy store chains before a certain private equity firm managed to contribute to the closure of both. This is a story from the big box store and took place around 1999. Like many big box stores, the store where I was working at the time of this story had over a dozen register lanes. Also, like many big box stores, there were seldom more than two assigned cashiers, with other staff assigned as backup. The store I worked at had recently been remodeled with a video game shop in a front corner of the store, with four registers in that section, registers 11 through 14. The primary cashiers were put on those registers, I have to have someone looking out for those pricey video games, so customers who wanted to check out had to walk into the video game section to get to an open register. On the day in question, I was the first backup cashier. This was irritating because I had work I had to get done and also because the manager that day had a tendency to call for backup when the lines got longer than two people. I'm working towards the back of the store, stocking shelves, helping customers, doing what I do when I hear the call. Pimento Cheesehead to your register. Pimento Cheesehead, please come to your register. So I drop what I'm doing and head to the front. Now, my register was not by the video section. It was the closest register to that section that wasn't actually in it, if that makes sense. So any customer wanting to leave the lines had a bit more to do than just step up to the next register. They had to leave the video section and come 10 or 15 feet to where the other registers were set up. If this sounds confusing, that's okay. It was just as confusing to our customers in person. I get to my register and log in and get on the PA to announce in my best friendly customer service voice, register 10 is open with no lines and no waiting. If you'd like to step down to register 10, Surprisingly, none of the four people waiting in line moved to my register, if they even heard the announcement. So after a few moments, I repeat it. Register 10 is open with no lines and no waiting. If you'd like to step down to register 10, again, there's no motion. Though two of the people in line did kind of look up to see if they could figure out where register 10 was. After a few moments more, I pick up the PA again and start talking. Register 10 is open with no lines and no waiting. If you'd like to step down to register 10, Open right now for a quick and easy checkout. No lines are waiting, and I'm happy to serve you right now at Register 10. You can easily locate Register 10 by the lighted 10 at the top of the register right here at Register 10, where I'm open for a quick and easy checkout. That may be an abbreviated version. A woman finally comes to my register, and she's cracking up, and asks with a big grin, Is this register open? I inform her that it is indeed open. Thank her for coming down to Register 10, Ring her up and get her out the door with a quick and easy checkout, Natch. And look up, there's no longer a line at the other two registers, so I head back to my assigned tasks. I got written up for that, for being unprofessional. Can't risk having any fun in a toy store, but it was absolutely worth it. Am I the jerk for giving my mom an ultimatum? She either gets on board or opts out. I, 22, male, adopted my daughter, 18 months, a few months after she was born since her birth mother, my ex-friend basically neglected her and I wanted to give her a chance at a better life. I don't have everything figured out, but my parents' attitude toward the entire situation hasn't been helpful either. They've never explicitly stated their opinions, but I know they think I basically threw away my life for my daughter. That's not even the case though. I kept up with schooling and I'm taking the MCAT in a few weeks. My mom makes consistent comments about what my twin brother has done and how he has a girlfriend and is living his life to try to make me feel like I made a big mistake. I got kind of fed up with everything and told her that she can either accept the situation and get on board or just opt out. She doesn't have to play grandma to her if she doesn't want to, but she just thinks I'm overreacting and she's thinking of the best for me. Edit, I'm just going to address a few things. This post isn't about whether I should go to med school or not. It's not my only option. Taking the test doesn't mean I have to go. Yes, I have childcare plans and I'm capable of taking care of her. I have support outside of my family. I have friends who are parents and I did think about this decision. I decided to become a parent. Stop debating that. Thank you. Edit 2. I never said that being a parent is easy. It's not. It's really hard. But never have I regretted my decision. 
I love my daughter and I don't expect for my life to go exactly as planned. Kindly stop debating and questioning my choices or intentions because it's not relevant and this is not a debate sub. Edit 3. Not sure how many times I have to say this, but this is not the place for you to debate my choices or my intentions when going about adopting her. I made a decision, which was not made lightly. I chose to be a parent and I am capable of doing this. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is their mom? Please let us know. Oh, I can't wait to read these comments. Please do tell us what you think. Am I the jerk for telling my husband that he is in fact just like his father? I'm 31, female, and my husband, who's 31, and I have four kids. A son who's nine, a daughter who's eight, and twins who are five. My husband and I were over the moon when we had our first two kids and were just very excited. The twins were a huge surprise, considering twins aren't common in either of our families, but we decided to keep them. However, my husband's attitude towards the twins has completely changed. I know it's tiring. We have other small kids running around too, but it's not like we're overwhelmed. My mother, who is still very young and fit, lives with us, and she usually takes care of the kids when she can. We aren't short on money either, as both of us come from pretty wealthy families. However, I know that sometimes that isn't even enough when it comes to parenting, so I decided to leave it. However, instead of moping around or just being distant, he's become pretty mean with the twins. He's always finding something to shout at them for. I kid you not, he shouts at them for being identical as if they purposely planned it. Plus, he's the perfect dad with the other kids. He only acts like this with the twins. I had enough yesterday when my youngest asked me why dad doesn't like him and whether I want him to disappear too. There's absolutely no way that my kid is lying about something like this. I don't think he has the mental ability to make up things like that either. I was furious and confronted my husband who was sound asleep in his room. I asked him what his problem was and why he was being such a jerk. He was confused so I explained. He then accused my son of lying and saying nonsense. Obviously, I didn't believe him and told him that he was exactly like his father. He got upset and left the house. I don't know where he went and honestly, I don't give a hoot. Side note, husband's father was in short, a real jerk. Very absent and cheated on his wife a lot. My husband vowed to never be like him and gets very heated at the mention of his dad. Anyways, my mother, who heard the whole thing go down, told me that I did the right thing by shouting at him, but I should not have mentioned his father. My sister, who I called later, said the same and told me to make a post on here just to see. So, am I the jerk for telling my husband that he is exactly like his jerk father? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. He needs to stop treating those babies like that. It ain't right, I tell you. Grandpa wants to threaten me for my money? I'll take you to jail myself. Very odd title, I know. So let me give you some backstory. This occurred several years ago. My grandfather is one of those Machiavellian types who could care less who he rips off. He spent the majority of his adult life in prison, including from the time I was 6 years old until I was 18. Essentially, he can't stay clean or away from crime. The lengthy stay during my childhood was for robbing a bank. After release, he's constantly stealing from his very elderly mother and doing every underhanded thing he can think of to avoid having to actually work. So after I graduate, I begin to work in the corrections field. After a couple of years in prisons, I managed to land a great job with a county home confinement office. This was great until my grandpa decided to rob a pharmacy and is placed on home confinement as a condition of his bond. I lived in another county than he did, but he managed to come to the city I live in to commit the crime, thus forcing him to find residents in my town to serve as home confinement. So he gets placed on home confinement and I explain to my supervisor, who I have a great relationship with, the situation. My supervisor doesn't really worry about it because he understands I have no real relationship with him and I'm not going to treat him any different than anybody else on our caseload. Everything goes fine for a couple weeks until my grandpa starts texting me when he knows I am on call to try and get out of the house. I tell him that I can't let him do that and he begrudgingly accepts that. Over time, he's constantly trying to get favors more and more. Family members asking me to deliver him money and groceries because I live in the same town, etc. Eventually, he gets hard up for money because his family source has cut him off and starts asking me. I tell him I can't do that and even if I could, I didn't have the money to give him. He isn't having that, so he decides to threaten to leave home and come to my house and tell my supervisor I gave him permission. 
Obviously, if he did this, it would show on GPS that he was at my house and that would look bad no matter what the circumstances. I decided to call his bluff and because of the escalation, I figured it was time to handle the situation before he takes it any further. The next morning, I tell my supervisor he should call him in for a random drug screen. This happens and to no surprise, he hits positive. This puts him in violation of his terms of release and I have the honors of putting him in handcuffs and driving him to jail myself. Upon his court date, because I was the one who charged him with violating home confinement, I got to go to the court hearing to find out if they would reinstate him. The judge asked if the home confinement office is okay with taking him back. Our local judges always ask us this on violations. I told him no, so my grandpa had to spend the next 8 months in jail. Karen took my cat, but I was set on getting him back. About 2 months ago, my cat somehow managed to get out of the house. I, 25 female, don't usually let my cat outside, save for letting him play in the back garden, which he can't escape due to how it's laid out. I personally think, because it's been so warm lately, that he got out by squeezing through one of the open windows, which was open by just a tiny crack, but it baffles me how, because a cat wouldn't be able to push it open by itself. I also keep doors closed and I'm very careful most of the time. My husband and I have no idea how it happened as it's never been an issue before. All in all, it was a very emotional time for me and my husband. My cat means everything to me. He's become something of an emotional support animal to me and he's over a year old. I raised him from a tiny stray kitten, waking up around the clock and hand feeding him milk to ensure he'd survive. I thought he wouldn't make it, but he miraculously pulled through and has been my best friend since. In short, I love my cat very much. On to the story. When my cat disappeared, I was besides myself with grief. My husband and I made posters. We contacted pet sanctuaries, pounds, vets, etc. in hopes he had shown up or someone had found him, but no luck. I was beginning to fear the worst. All kinds of scenarios played out in my head and I was finding it hard to sleep. Eventually, a month later, we got a call. It was from a woman who worked in nearby old folks home. I cried with relief as she explained that they had found my baby and asked me to come collect him. When my husband and I got there though, we were mortified to see our cat in such a poor state. He had lost weight and his coat was matted. He was afraid to go near us. We knew it was him, but he was so unrecognizable. The worker went on to explain how he had shown up and a resident, an old woman, had kept him hidden in a box under her bed and he was only discovered when another worker began to get suspicious over the smell of cat pee. I fought back tears because not only had my boy gone through that, but also that this sad, lonely woman was desperate for some form of companionship. A part of me felt guilty until the old woman's family showed up. I tried to gently explain that I wanted to take my cat back because he belongs to me and he needs to see a vet, but the family yelled at me, calling me heartless for taking an old woman's only friend away and how they had gotten attached, so the family knew but also kept it a secret from staff. I said I was sorry but I had bonded with my cat. He's in my name and he needs to come home. They proceed to call me a monster. Thankfully, my cat is doing much better now and has gone back to his old self. But the family has yet to stop harassing me and my husband. I'm reluctant to complain because I don't want to cause the old woman any more grief as she's clearly unwell. Am I the jerk? Info and updates. 1. From what I now know, the old woman actually did let him roam around her room and feed him. But I'm almost certain it wasn't cat food, so we did check in with the vet when we had him looked over and thankfully it didn't seem like it was anything toxic. She had him hid under the bed when it came to routine medicine and room checks. I never did find out how she got him, but I can only assume he wandered off or was tempted by food or caught somehow. 2. The family must have been called when the incident was reported, maybe out of concern, hence why they showed up suddenly. As for how the family managed to harass me, it took me a while before I took down as many of the missing cat posters as I could, but my first priority was making sure my cat was safe. Someone could have taken pictures of the posters on their phones, plus the care home is very local, as in just around the corner from me and I can only assume that families live close by too, as they saw me out buying food a few times and I'm certain they figured out where I live. 3. My cat is microchipped and collared. Sadly, my cat's collar was taken off and hidden in an old woman's room. I've since thrown it away and gotten him a new collar because looking at it now makes me feel uncomfortable. 
4. Why should I feel so guilty? It's mostly to do with the bad childhood that I had. I won't go into too much detail, but I was made to feel guilty about a lot of things when I wasn't even at fault. Also, I've worked in care homes and I've seen the worst when it comes to dementia. 5. I don't think the old woman is a bad person. She's clearly very lonely and suffering. It may not be an excuse, but if she truly has dementia or something wrong with her, I can only imagine how difficult that must be for a lonely old lady. I am planning on getting her a faux cat to at least show some compassion because it seems her own family doesn't care. Yes, I'm appalled at what happened. I hate the fact I could have lost my cat. But this old woman is very sick from what it seems. Making her suffer more isn't going to help matters. However, my husband is going to be calling the police on the family tomorrow. I only hope it doesn't affect the old lady. I will update further if necessary. Thank you for all of your support. It really does mean a lot. Speaking of cats, do you have a cat? And if so, what is their name? Please let us know. Best name for a cat, Fluffy, hands down. Rude customer didn't know my brother was the owner. Hello, people of Reddit. I've been working as a server slash bartender since I was 16 years old and got used to plenty of rude customers over the eight years I've been in this workplace, but this one takes first place. I wrote this more because I want to rant to people who would understand very well how I felt that night. A little backstory. I recently quit working as a server, yay, and started working 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. as a store clerk. Better paid and works better for me. I live in a small tourist town where most people know each other and there are a lot of tourists during the summer. My brother has a restaurant which is open from mid-spring until early autumn. I help out whenever he needs it after I finish my other job at 7 p.m. Monday was a national holiday in my country and the weekend was expected to be very busy. And it was. I could barely keep up with the tables I got and stuff was getting hectic in the kitchen and it was really slow in there. Cue in the rude customer. I bring the menu to the two guys, rude guy with a chill friend, who just sat and as I'm leaving their table to get to some other customers who want to order something, this guy stops me and, with no intention of reading the menu, asks me, What beer do you guys have? Me. They are all listed in the menu. You can see them on there. I'll be right back with you, sir. Just one moment. Rude guy. I ain't reading that. Just tell me what beers you have. Me used to those kinds of customers. We've got draft, this and that and this. Was that so hard to tell me? Bring me this one and some fish and some fries. Me. Sir, it's very busy right now and it'll take at least 40 minutes for the fries and the fish to be ready. Can I offer you some salads or something on the barbecue while the rest gets ready? Rude guy with a loud tone. Do I look like someone who's gonna wait? My kid will be here in 10 minutes and if the fish isn't here, I will not be paying. Me, getting irritated. Sir, there are tons of other orders before you and we cannot bring yours before that. I don't care. Who are you to tell me that I have to wait? Bring it or else. Me, already fed up with everything. Dude, first of all, you have no right to talk to me like that. Second, your order will not be ready in less than 40 minutes because there are other customers before you and because I'm not going to serve you get out of here. I went to my other table, had three who were waiting to order, got the orders and continued to do my job. Five minutes pass by and this guy comes to the bar and asks to see the boss. My brother works as chief every day and this guy clearly knows him but not me. Rude guy. John. Not my brother's real name of course. Your server says he doesn't want to serve me. Oh, what is this? My brother who knows what's going on. Yeah, that server is my brother and you were in the wrong acting like a jerk. Rude guy, mouth wide open. Uh, this is your brother? John, uh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. Rude guy to me. Accept my apologies, I didn't know you were his brother. Me, whatever, just know you were in the wrong, no matter if I'm the owner's brother or not. He stayed and I had to serve him anyway. He was all apologetic for the rest of the night and left a decent tip. I was fuming for the rest of the night because of that. Why does he think that it's okay to be rude to the servers as long as they're not related to the owner? What the heck? Also, he is a townie and my brother later told me that this is the way he acts usually. He's the type of guy to get his butt kicked every time there's a fight in the local pub. I'm so happy I kinda got away from this waiter's job. I still will be helping my brother whenever he needs help, but at least it's not every day. Thanks for coming to my rant. 
wish you all to have less jerks as customers as possible. No, we're not putting ourselves in danger so you can sleep better. This happened a few weeks ago when my hotel was sold out. It was a Sunday, which meant that about 90% of the hotel was departing and heading towards the airport. Around 10 a.m., one of the housekeepers calls down from the room she's cleaning on the seventh floor and says we need to send someone up because she can hear screaming and what sounds like things being thrown against the walls in the room next to her. Now, we aren't a resort hotel, despite being near a hot vacation spot, so we don't have a dedicated security team. Usually, it's one of the bellhops, engineers, or supervisors that deals with security issues like this. I call it in, and the chief engineer volunteers to check it out. However, before he can even get up there, I get three other calls from nearby rooms, all complaining that they've been woken up by what sounds like fighting. A minute later, chief engineer calls for backup over the radio and tells me to call 911. So now we have three other people, two bellmen and the housekeeping supervisor rushing up to the seventh floor while the general manager calls 911. I'm getting more calls from the seventh floor and I have no clue what's going on right now. Every now and then someone's walkie is pushed, but I can't make out any words, just static and noise. I tell anyone that calls that we have security dealing with the issue and we'll be evicting the guests who are causing the noise shortly. About 10 minutes pass and the lovely image of three police cars pull up to the front entrance, every supervisor's dream. They go up to the seventh floor and then escort the two men who were fighting off the property. There was a woman with them too and police remained with her in the room as she gathered up their things and then left in her own car. Apparently, they were brothers and got into a fight over money. Neither of them were pressing charges, so neither were arrested, just removed because we were now refusing service to them. For the rest of the morning, curiosity got the better of everyone who heard the incident and they stopped by the front desk asking what happened. We give the usual, business smart answers of, oh, there was a conflict between two guests, but they've been removed from the property. Most people were understanding since the whole incident was resolved within approximately 15 minutes. However, there was this one grumpy lady that wasn't very understanding. This happened about four hours after the incident. Grumpy lady approaches the desk. Excuse me, I'd like to check out of my room, 713. Me, sure, was everything fine with your stay? I guess. All right then, would you like a paper copy or email of your receipt today? So, you're not going to compensate me? Me, visibly confused. Ugh, I'm sorry? Was there something wrong with your stay? I don't see anything on your reservation. That fight! I was woken up and scared for my life. What if they had had weapons? I could have been hurt. Me, I'm so sorry about the racket that woke you up, ma'am. I can assure you that everyone is safe and the two men who got into the fight were removed from the property as soon as the police arrived. As soon as they arrived? That's ridiculous. I could hear them fighting and screaming for 15 minutes. Me. Well, yes. As soon as we verified what was happening, we called the police right away. I called the desk several times while it was happening. All you told me was that you were handling it. Obviously you weren't, because it went on for so long. When I looked outside my room, your bellhops were just standing by the elevator, doing nothing, while those men brawled in the hallway. Me. Ma'am, we are, unfortunately, at the mercy of however long it takes the police to arrive. My bellmen aren't trained to safely get between brawling guests, so we waited for the police. So, you're saying you have no control over your own guests? Me. We can't know what someone is going to do when they check in. We assume that everyone is here to relax or here for business. I want to speak to a manager. I want compensation. Me. I am the manager on duty. We handled the situation as quickly and as safely as we could, ma'am. Again, I'm sorry they woke you up, but I won't be compensating you since the situation was not the hotel's fault. I will not ask my coworkers to put themselves in harm's way. Fine. I'm contacting corporate. Grumpy lady walked away after that and about an hour later, a customer care case hits our system. I told the GM about the incident right away, and she agreed it wasn't our fault, so we're not refunding her anything. To top it off, Grumpy Lady was staying with us on an employee rate, so we double-checked her form and called the property she worked for, only to find out that she had been fired two months ago. So technically, we were giving her compensation. She was supposed to pay full price, 
but we decided to leave her at the employee rate since we knew she'd be a big headache if we tried to charge her double the price. Bonus event. One of the guys we kicked out came back to the hotel around 6 p.m. that night trying to get into his old room. He was really out of it and couldn't understand why he had been evicted. I am not a B&B. Little backstory. I am a mathematic teacher. Fear me, high schoolers. In June 2020, me and my wife bought a house in a small city in the east of the Netherlands, and it was a little bit of a workhouse, a new kitchen, some wall fixing, and of course, getting rid of big heating plates and replace them with floor heating. This house also has a front garden. Well, more like, eh, let's put some stuff randomly in and some boxwood in a pattern and let the weeds cover the rest, and the front window with a small leak, which causes for some little moisture between the glass plates. Not the finest fronts a house can have, yes, this is important. Also, in our area are a lot of camping places and B&Bs, also important. To the story. During summer holiday, we replaced the kitchen and did more stuff and the house is getting somewhere, still stuff to do, but if the government is not donating money for some work in houses, then I will have to save for it. Three months later, the kitchen is in and it's getting more homely. Finally, some relaxation and to enjoy the fruit of our labor and to float in the swimming pool. But then I heard the doorbell. Went to the door and saw two people, a man and a woman around their 40s with backpacks looking at my door. I thought, why would they be here? For the conversation, we've got backpack lady and we've got backpack man. Backpack lady. Hi, we want to stay here for the night. We made a reservation. Me thinking, reservation? For what? Using the bathroom? Getting a one-star dinner with my cooking skills? Me. A reservation for what? For the B&B. In the meantime, Backpack Man was just standing behind her. I saw he had a bit of trouble with his backpack. He was a bit unbalanced. Me. Um, this is not a B&B. This is my house. Then there were a few seconds of silence with both of them and me just standing, looking around. It felt like five hours. Oh, okay. Where is the B&B? Me, thinking. Uh, I think there's one down the street. Ah, okay. Bye. And they left. Backpack man never said anything. Thinking. Why would they think this is a B&B? I searched on the internet and found the answer. I live on number 27. There is a B&B at number 17. I checked the B&B and the garden is lovely and even has a sign at their house. My house doesn't have that. Can't wait for next summer to see if more people come to my house. Am I the jerk for not trading my vegan meal with vegan who got a non-vegan meal? When I was invited to a friend's wedding, I got a card to indicate which meal I wanted. They were offering a choice of a meat dish or a vegan dish. The meat dish they were going to serve is one of my least favorite things. When I eat it, I have to spit it out and feel like I'm gagging because it tastes so bad to me. Since I have such an aversion to the meat dish, I decided to check off as wanting the vegan dish. By the time dinner is being served, I am absolutely starved because I didn't have time to eat earlier that day as I ran late. Some of the people at my table notice that the other guests at a neighboring table are having issues because they were served the meat dish instead of the vegan dish and they are vegan. The waiter goes back to check in the kitchen to get her a vegan dish. Meanwhile, my table is being served and I get the vegan dish I ordered. One of the people at my table noticed that I have a vegan dish. He knows I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan, so he questioned if I got the lady at the neighboring table's food by mistake. He unfortunately says this loud enough that the neighboring table hears and everyone starts looking at me. I explained that I actually ordered the vegan dish because I do not like the meat dish. By this time, the waiter comes back and explains to the lady that there was a mistake and they do not have another vegan dish as they were only told a certain amount of dishes. So a guy from the ladies table comes over to me and asks me to trade. I told him I really can't stand the meat dish. He gets argumentative and says it doesn't matter if I don't like it, I can still eat it and she can't. I said no again. He says I'm being a picky little baby and tries to take the plate. Then another lady from his table pulls the man away and I eat my food. Later, when it's time for cake, I get a vegan dessert. It looks just as good as the cake, but I think about offering to trade the vegan dessert with a lady as I see she got the cake. I ask others at my table, they say not to because it will just get the man mad again and they saw that he was drinking a lot, so I don't. Later, as everyone is leaving though, 
I hear a comment from the guy again, saying that me, the fake vegan, apparently has issues with cake too. Edit. Apparently a lot of people are confused because I keep getting this question. The card I'm referencing in the first paragraph came with the invitation and RSVP way before the wedding. The card specifically asked which dish I wanted and I checked off the vegan dish. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you give your vegan dish to her or not? Please let us know. No, and I'd spit on it as soon as they tried to take it from me. Family shares everything? If you say so. So this happened a little while after I turned 18 years old. One day, my mom and dad decided to take me with them to go grocery shopping. I really liked going shopping with them at the time because much like now, my appetite was close to insatiable. And for me, that meant food, food, and more food. By the end of our run, I literally had an entire shopping cart of stuff. Frozen pizzas, spicy noodles, lunch meat, bread, etc. Mostly spicy food because I love to have some bark with my bite. Fast forward a few days after. I had just come home from school and all I could think about was watching a movie and stuffing my face with pizza. But when I opened the freezer, I saw that out of the three pizzas I had, only one was left. I was upset at this because I knew for a fact that I hadn't eaten them myself. About two hours later, my parents come home and I asked them both if they had eaten my pizzas. My dad said no, he hadn't. But my mom, my sweet entitled mom, didn't even try to deny it. I asked her why she didn't just ask me for one of the pizzas. I also added that had she asked, I would have just given her one of them. Her response, I don't have to ask you for anything. You're my son and this is my house. I got angry and responded with, yeah, this is your house, but I paid for that with my own money. Money that I made on my own. I paid for it. The least you could do is ask before you start going into my stuff. For the record, this happened a lot. We would all go food shopping, my mom would get the bare minimum and then help herself to whatever me or my dad bought. She didn't like what I said and her response was, I don't care if you paid for it yourself. I didn't raise you to be selfish. We're family. And in this house, family shares everything. Cue malicious compliance. One thing I'd like to add is that my mom at this time had a massive sweet tooth. If it had lots of sugar or high fructose corn syrup, she just had to have it. One day when she had left for work, I went into the kitchen and came across her not so secret stash of assorted sugary sweets. M&Ms, Skittles, Starbursts, the works. So I went into that bag and took every single pack of Skittles out, leaving just the other stuff. I gleefully ate the Skittles and for the remainder of her absence, chilled out in my room and waited. When she got home, she sat down to watch TV for a while and then she went for her bag of candy. And let me tell you, her reaction was almost as sweet as her secret stash. At first, she had assumed that my dad had eaten the candy but that was brushed off considering that my dad didn't like Skittles for some reason. Then she came to me and asked if I had eaten it. Much like her, I didn't deny it. She immediately started ripping into me, saying that I had no right to go into her stuff and how she had ground me for doing it. I simply shook my head. Then when she asked me why I went into her bag, I looked at her with an innocent smile and said, Well, you said family shares everything, so I didn't think you'd mind if I ate some of your candy. There was a few seconds of silence. Then without a word, my mom walked out of the room. My food stopped going missing after that. Am I the jerk for telling my wife if she insists that my sister move out, I won't defend her or her choice? I, 34, male, am married and we have two kids who are both three. And over the past year, my sister, Amy, who's 19, has been living with me and my wife, Leah, who's 36, because of lockdown. My parents live in another state and the only reason they felt comfortable with Amy going to college out of state was because my wife and I promised to be there for her in case of trouble. After the shutdown, Amy moved in with us and eventually decided to take some time off because she felt too stressed out. Initially, Leia seemed fine with that because Amy got a job and started helping around the house. Examples, doing all the laundry, cleaning the living room, doing the grocery shopping, paying for the groceries, cooking breakfast four days a week, cooking dinner three days a week, cleaning the kitchen, vacuuming, and babysitting so long as we gave her 48-hour notice. Amy did all of this to show how grateful she was to us and because she wasn't paying rent. After Amy got a job, I sat down with her and worked out budgeting system with her, 
so once she went back to school, she could put her money towards college expenses. She rarely buys anything luxurious for herself and asks me to double check her finances regularly so I know she's not just blowing it. I thought everything was great until Leia told me that she wanted Amy out. When I inquired why, she at first didn't give a real reason for me to support it and then I found out that Leia's cousin got a new job near where we lived and needed a place to stay and would offer to pay us rent until they got their own place. Leia feels like Amy has stayed long enough and wants someone who can offer financial contribution. I told her that I didn't support this decision and would not be kicking my sister out when she's putting in the work to better herself. I was upset and said if she wanted Amy out, then she'd have to tell her herself, but warned her that my parents would see her as greedy and not to expect me to defend her. Now Leia isn't talking to me and after a couple of days I need to ask, am I the jerk? ETA. Forgot to add to this story, but yes, I did run Amy paying rent by Leia as a compromise. However, Amy barely makes above minimum wage, and even if she factored in paying rent, it wouldn't be nearly as much as what Leia's cousin is offering. Also, it hasn't been explicitly said, but it's looking like Leia's cousin will pay rent but not help around the house. At most, just clean up after themselves. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Oh, I can't wait to read these comments. Please do tell us what you think. Sir, I don't think this is you. About 10 years ago, I worked at a chain hardware and home improvement store. Back then, their return policies were pretty straightforward and return cashiers were allowed to refuse items based on those policies. One such policy was that any return without a receipt and over $25 required a valid governmental issued identification, license, passport, military ID, etc. So I'm working the returns counter, my favorite assignment because I was allowed to actually not take crap from customers. This customer comes in for a return and drops about $150 of rechargeable lithium batteries on my desk. I ask him for his receipt, he doesn't have it. I inform him of the policy requiring ID and he says he left it in the car, he'll be right back. Now these batteries were a high theft item and usually in those scenarios they would say they'd be back, leave the items on my desk and never come back. In this case, he did come back about 35 minutes later with an ID. I take it from him and try to not start laughing while inspecting if it's real. The following conversation occurs. Me. Sir, is this your ID? Him. Yeah, I just renewed it a week ago. The date does show it was issued a week ago. Me. So your name is blank? Him. Yes. Gives me full, including middle name. Me. Can you verify the address? He does. Me. Okay, sir. I have to give you this back because I don't think this is you and I can't do your return. Him. Before I hand the ID back. Why not? I swear, that's me. Me. Sir, the ID states that you're a 200 pound, 6 foot 1 black man. Him. And? Me, looking at him and trying to understand how that didn't click for him. Well, you're a 5'7 ish, about 135 pound white dude. We stare at each other for a moment. He slowly takes his ID and leaves. I called a manager to mark the batteries as a recovery and we had about 25 packs stolen the week before and have a laugh about it. Note, my state, I don't remember if others do, lists your height, age, eye color, and weight on your license with your picture. Customers can't read signs, or they can, but choose to ignore it. Recently, my work, clothing store, opened back up one new rule is that only every second change room is allowed open. This is to enforce social distancing by reducing the amount of people in that area of the store. So people are aware a change room is closed. We have stuck a sign, white laminated paper, at eye level onto the change room's dark gray curtain, which is also left closed. The section I work in has two change rooms, so only one is available to use. I went to see if the other customer in the change room needed any help and noticed that there was someone in the other one too the one that is meant to be closed. I stood next to the curtain and said, Hi, excuse me, there is a sign saying this change room is closed. I'll need you to exit out of this one and use the one that isn't closed when it becomes available. Thank you. The customer opened the curtain and began picking up her belongings. Yes, I know, I saw the sign, but the other change room is being used. I told her that the rules still apply even if the available change room is being used. She'll just have to wait her turn. Five minutes later, and no, I'm not exaggerating. 
I caught another customer in the closed change room. I went up to the curtain and repeated what I said to the other lady. The customer opens up the change room and says, Oh, sorry, I didn't see the sign. Again, white sign, dark gray curtain, pinned at eye level. Also, this was in the kids section of my store, so clearly these ladies are setting a good example for their kids. The rules don't apply if you can't be bothered waiting. Edit. Yes, taking down the curtain would solve the problem, but I don't have the authority to do that as I'm not a manager. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.